probably doesn't need an introduction and therefore I will limit my introduction to a few minimalist comments. Um, well, uh, anybody who has ever studied uh, European studies will have uh, probably used a textbook in the, in the manual and uh, manuals are interesting uh, objects because they distill what uh, you know the discipline thinks is relevant, important, long-lasting. And uh, Andrew Morabchik is uh, a, a regular um, presence in these in these manuals. So you go through the various uh, theories, you learn about uh, realism, you learn about uh, uh, functionalism, then neo-functionalism, and then you come to liberal intergovernmentalism, and uh, you learn that uh, purely realist approach is not sufficiently sophisticated, that there's no such a big distinction or not always between high politics and low politics, and uh, things are more complex, but states can indeed be seen as unitary actors under certain circumstances. And this is what uh, Andrew's uh, is told us, and this is what uh, all our students learn year after year after year. So um, it is really with a great pleasure that uh, I'm able to introduce such a prominent uh, scholar in the field of uh, European studies. But Andrew's not stopped to, with uh, liberal intergovern intergovernmentalism and has done many more um, studies and uh, has taken on many more challenges. And to anybody who is alive in these uh, difficult days and, and years, uh, probably the biggest uh, challenge is, is populism. And when we think about populism, we tend to think about uh, a huge sprawling body of literature. However, it is a body of literature that is mostly uh, comparative politics and is mostly party politics. Uh, it tells us that um, um, populists like to think of the world as split between uh, um, elites uh, and, uh, and the people, and that there is such a thing as a unitary people, and that uh, elites are intent on cheating and uh, betraying these, uh, these people. Now, when uh, uh, you transfer these simple concepts on the international arena, things become a little more complex because, uh, uh, you know, who is the people exactly and who are the elites that betray us? And, uh, and that uh, is the reason why populism in, in the international arena is possibly less studied because, uh, because populists have taken very different uh, approaches to their job of uh, hating elites. And also because these elites uh, sometimes uh, uh, seem to um, not last very long, uh, but neither do the people because, you know, this idea of the homogeneity of the people is, is challenged by evidence. This is why very often uh, um, populist uh, leaders don't last very long. And the question is, why did they not last very long? Obviously, we had uh, in prominent examples in America in particular with Donald Trump. Uh, uh, but again, Donald Trump didn't last very long in the end, you know. He has a lot of support, he still has a lot of support. Um, there are other leaders that have lasted uh, longer, possibly, uh, Orban in Hungary, and Andrew has a Hungarian background, so he can tell us about that as well. Um, we have uh, coalition governments with uh, populist actors, and these populist uh, um, uh, leaders in coalition governments often are not able to achieve what they want. The question is, why not? Um, so really is, uh, is, a, is a very complex field and is a field that has not sufficiently been studied, partly for the reasons I, I mentioned and partly for other reasons that, uh, uh, that are fairly complex and that uh, we really need uh, to uh, learn uh, to study, and I'm sure Andrew will give us a big hand in that. So, uh, thanks, Andrew, again for being here, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, normally, I walk around in talks, but I think I'm pinned to this microphone. So, uh, um, 
Thanks very much for the introduction. It's great to be here. Carlo and I have already been discussing this quite a bit in the last uh, uh, couple of days. Um, so I'd like to throw some ideas out from a study we've been doing on the policy consequences, or foreign policy consequences of, of uh, extreme right-wing populist governments. It's a topic I did discuss it here at the uh, Festival de l'Economia, I think 2018 or something. Um, and so the very beginning of the talk draws on that stuff, but we've done a lot more um, research. And the angle that I'm interested in, as, as Carlo suggested, um, is why, what, what impact populists actually have on foreign policy. Um, and European policy? Is it large or small? How does it vary? Uh, and that I talked about in 2018. And, and as you'll see, take a view a little bit more like Kasmuda and other people who think that populists don't really get a lot done in government. But the theoretical question is, how do we explain the variation we see between cases in which they do more and cases which they do less and the ways in which they do it and the issues that they choose? Um, and thirdly, which I didn't discuss at all before, how do they manage the tensions between rhetoric and reality that emerge because they're uh, doing this? Um, and when I first started working on this, I went to look at the secondary, oh, I should crank this up. Uh, how does this work? There we go. Um, okay. Um, I uh, when I first started this, I I went to the secondary literature on this, which, as Carlo mentions, is absolutely enormous. I mean, there's the famous uh, statistic that more has been written about this party family uh, since 1980 than all other party families in the world combined. Right? I mean, it's just a humongous literature. So I'm plowing through this. Um, and I found two things that I thought were interesting. The first was that when it came to talking about policy consequences, um, the literature was itself polarized, the polarized literature about polarized politics. There were the people who were um, completely pessimistic, as are many uh, newspaper columnists and so on. Um, you know, take, for example, Hogan Marx, um, you know, preeminent EU scholars and European comparative scholars, and, and their conventional wisdom is we should forget everything we learned before about the functional and, and interest driven nature of the EU because it's now totally different. There now needs to be a post functional theory because this kind of politics represented by extreme right populists is what everybody does. Um, John Eikenberry, my co colleague, IR colleague at Princeton, same thing. The major challenge facing the liberal global order is the rise uh, of these groups. And then on the other side, you had people um, more focused on studying the empirics of, of populism, Kasmuda is an example, who say, well, you know, I'm not even sure we really need to study these because they don't really seem to achieve very much and they'll disappear and, and, and so on. What seemed clear to me was that in foreign policy, there was a fair amount of variation and nobody was even really trying to explain that variation. So then I thought, well, I'm gonna to go to the empirical literature and see what the empirics say. And there I was even more surprised, which is there's to a first approximation, almost none of it. I mean, such a shockingly small amount of literature given these enormous literatures on defining populism on, um, uh, talking about why people vote for populists, talking about how they structure their rhetoric, discourse analysis, blah, 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 you know, but, but then when you say, okay, so what comes out the other end, um, the amount of work is shockingly small. Example, if you look at the Oxford Handbook on Populism, which I think came out two years ago or maybe three, um, there's there 750 pages roughly in it, of which two paragraphs are on foreign policy consequences even though these groups primarily have a foreign policy directed rhetoric. It's all about nationhood. It's all about globalization, things like that. So we set out to 
investigate this. Um, and uh, we set out to, to answer kind of three simple questions. One was how much impact do these groups really have on uh, foreign policy? Um, secondly, how do we explain the variation in that impact? And third, um, how do they rhetorically manage the tensions um, between rhetoric and reality? And the study we're doing differs from previous studies in part because we're collecting systematic evidence across many issues, more than 30 uh, foreign and European policy issues um, across quite a number of countries. Um, so far, I think we have eight going, but we're hoping to get up to 12 or 15. Um, and that these are controlled studies. So instead of making assumptions like um, there's migration policy and it's more closed and extreme right pol pol uh, parties support that, therefore they caused it, we actually look at the causal trend and try to figure out whether that's a supportable um, uh, 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 argument. So let me just talk through these three points. And really what I want to get to is discussion, since I know they're starting with Carlo, people who studied populism more intensively than I have. So, um, you know, we have all these um, populists uh, out there. Um, when we looked broadly speaking, so very crudely at their policy outputs, what we find is that Mud is right to a first approximation. There is surprisingly little and quite precisely scattered um, policy effects, much less than you would likely claim about the domestic politics of most of these uh, countries. So here's one example. We took just the countries where there'd been a substantial um, presence of um, right wing, extreme right wing populist in power as of 2020 and 2021. Um, and, um, and we just looked at the big issues, uh, setting aside Trump for the moment, because we have a whole enormous thing on Trump, we'll talk about it at the end, but in Europe. Um, and, uh, and what we, the, uh, the entries in the boxes are what was the position of the party and then what was the policy outcome. And basically the bottom line here is that you see no effect except for three exceptions. One is migrant quotas. Um, the second is EU rule of law. And the third is Brexit. Um, not, for example, migration. So as I said before, when we looked at migration closely country by country, starting with the United States, it's really very hard to support the argument that the main reason why uh, we have migration restrictions in the modern world in developed countries is because of these parties. They are, they are the messenger in some countries, uh, but they're not the cause. How do we know that? Well, because there are lots of countries that don't have appreciable populist parties like Lithuania, for example, and more or less has the same uh, migration policy as other countries um, around it. We know it because the time trend doesn't work. Obama's migration policy was when you judge by the effects of keeping people out, actually accelerated closure of the United States faster than Trump did. Um, uh, and we know this because the historical work shows that countries in Europe have systematically been concerned about the political explosiveness precisely of this issue for at least 40 or 50 years. You just have to look at Emmanuel Kant's 2018 book on the history of the European migration. Uh, regime, which is quite good um, to see that. So we didn't code um, tightening the external border, this line here, as being something where um, we, we coded that as the uh, right-wing populist had the same position as the European consensus and were constructive members of that consensus. The difference for some countries was on this issue of migrant quotas. And I'll, I'll return to that at the end. Uh, um, but this is just to generate kind of what you find. Now, if we'd extended this to include all 30 issues that we have, and we're into the weeds on this, like, you know, development policy and, and uh, uh, you know, Turkey and all manner of things, you find it's almost entirely green. You just find populist parties coming in and often not elaborating an alternative. And when they do elaborate an alternative, they generally don't get it. 
So you, you end up with a pretty continuous line across countries of, of foreign policy uh, positions. So I'm happy to discuss this further in questions, but, but again, since I discussed this before in Trento and I'd like to stipulate it and get onto the part that I'm less sure about and you could help me with, um, let's just stipulate this for the moment. So the second and third questions I'll deal with together, that's what explains this pattern of non-achievement of goals, but variation in countries and issues. And um, what are the rhetorical consequences? Um, so it's not very credible, I think, and we could talk about this more, but our conclusion is it's not very credible to blame institutional constraints. So in the United States, it's very common on journalists and so on to say, well, Trump didn't get much done because of the deep state. This is kind of Bob Woodward's position and other journalists, if you read American books, that somehow the military and other people blocked him, blocked him, blocked him, blocked him. But when you actually um, go through this, what you find is that Trump and his allies, it delayed him. But when he really wanted to get something done, like on Afghanistan and other things, he was actually pretty effective at overcoming bureaucratic obstacles. Moreover, it doesn't really tell you why these people have more of an impact in domestic politics than they do in international politics, because actually, for most foreign policymakers, their institutional and legal constraints are considerably less in foreign policy than they are in domestic policy. So why would it be that foreign policy is the area where they don't get anything done and in domestic politics they do? Um, it's also not credible to say that these parties don't intrinsically care at all. Um, most um, extreme right populist parties started the evolution of the last 20 years with pretty radical positions on a lot of these issues uh, and others, and even occasionally allude to them, um, but they uh, just didn't get very much uh, done. And because there's variation um, and, and because they don't get less done, we can kind of set aside the Huge Marx view that they're just have a magic ideology that everybody believes or they're such good liars that everybody believes what they say. So instead we start with a kind of very simple and almost naive approach, which is let's just take the verities of comparative and international politics and apply them to this case. And those verities are that the goal of a party is to get itself elected into parliament. And then if possible, to get into the government, and then if possible to change policy in that order. Um, kind of a standard political science assumption across different sub-disciplines. Um, now it's, it's clear, and lots of people have mentioned, Kasmuda talks about this, that uh, let's call them ERP parties, extreme right populist parties, um, start with some disadvantages because they start at the end of the political spectrum. So the central challenge they face is to figure out how to get support from moderates in one form or another so that they can have a, enough clout to change policy. And they need to do this without losing touch with their base. And I think if you read case studies, I mean, Trump is an obvious case, but case studies of any of these people, this is really what they obsess about, <coughs> which is how do you increase your moderate support or form alliances with moderate parties um, at the same time um, uh, maintaining the enthusiasm and support of your base. Now, who are these moderates? And then we can divide the analysis into three parts. There are three different obstacles of, of convincing moderates that these parties need to uh, surmount. The first is they need to get moderate voters to become big enough so they can have some clout. Then they need to get moderate party support or party faction support because there will be organized groups uh, who are uh, opposed to their ideology. And because this is international relations, and this is one reason why in foreign policy they get less, they need to get moderate support from other countries in order to do what they want to do. And the countries tend to be more moderate um, too. Another way to put this is that if they want to change foreign policy, they need to change the mind of voters, change the mind of parties and their constituents um, and some foreign government. Now these moderates by and large, um, whether 
individuals or constituents or other parties or other countries. Um, the moderate right segment of, in every country, the political spectrum um, tends to support, broadly speaking, business interests and be supportive of economic interdependence and cooperation with other countries. So in foreign policy, this poses a very clear challenge, right? How are you gonna get moderates who are not disposed to support you to support you? And the simple solution to this problem for them is to give everybody what they want. You give extremists talk and you give moderates action, all right? In a simple uh, statement, that's, that's our claim. Now, how this works and how well it works varies across countries considerably as a function of the structural circumstances in which they find themselves. So for the next 15 minutes, what I wanna do is basically talk through the challenges that they face and how this explains different countries and issues. So what do countries need to do? Or what does a party need to do if they want to become more powerful? They need to secure some kind of legislative representation. So win more popular votes and a larger popular uh, set of seats, which is interestingly not quite the same thing. Um, they need to influence the government by entering it and persuading other more moderate parties to support them. And they must negotiate with foreign governments where either they're gonna reach an accommodation um, or be prepared to act unilaterally. In the modern world, as opposed to the, the old realist world that, that Carlo talked about at the start, um, there are a lot of positive sum issues. So working this out with other countries is um, uh, essential. And our claim is simply, this is essentially impossible to do for most countries, and certainly for most countries and more issues, and hence we don't um, see it. So let's see why. We'll just start with securing legislative uh, representation. So what's the problem here? The problem is that the extreme views that these people have have something like 10 to, you know, at the outside, 25% public opinion support everywhere in the developed world. Um, you know, remember that the Republican Party in the United States, and I consider the United States the greatest threat to world order currently, at least in the Western world. I hope this is not being taped. Uh, um, is, uh, you know, Republican Party is 28% of the population, and the Trump faction of the Republican Party is maybe, um, you know, half of that. So you got 14%. I mean, it's right where it should be, even though the United States is structurally a pretty conservative country. So, um, so what we see almost everywhere, and so this is just the votes, is that most of these parties are pretty small. Um, so that if you just go through the whole world, uh, a whole Europe, uh, European region, um, you know, you have a lot of, you have some places that have no parties, you have some places where the parties are pretty tiny, some places where they're kind of medium sized and a relatively few up at the top where these have a lot of electoral support. Um, so this, is a, this creates a really enormous challenge from the start. Um, now these numbers, I think, are not um, simply the outcomes of a complex political process and strategic calculations. They're in some sense structural. That is the things we talked about before moderate opinions about cooperation and moderate opinions about globalization um, that more moderate people have are really um, attributes of their fundamental uh, belief system. So if you just ask people um, how much they're attached uh, to the EU, to take one kind of bellwether question, and also how economically interdependent they are and how much they benefit from the EU, what you find out is that either in the even in the countries that are most um, hostile, there's an appreciable level of support. In fact, famously, Hungary and Poland are the two countries in Europe that in polling terms are most pro-EU. Um, so you know you're talking about a country where 95% of the people um, feel attached to the EU in some way. That's an environment in which it's very different to move the needle. And similarly, the level of economic interdependence for many of these countries is, is phenomenal. I'm gonna to return to this, but I'm just putting it up here to suggest that these numbers um, are, 
are structural as well as just being outcomes of a very complicated process of political um, interaction. So, um, so, um, so in this in this map, we have quite a number of countries here that we can essentially set aside from this chart. That it's very unlikely that a party that doesn't exist or a party that gets 7% of the vote is gonna have a decisive impact on the foreign policy uh, of a country. And even in cases like France, where you have a, a party, the Rassemblement National, that gets a appreciable number of votes, an electoral system that's quite biased against them, so they get fewer seats. Um, their power in the country, so in, in this region, is tiny. So this is basically what Marine Le Pen has to work with. Um, she got hammered twice in presidential elections. You know, you read the press and it's all about the first round and is she gonna get 27% or 26%? People always forget she just gets beat two to one every time. I mean, Emmanuel Macron is the luckiest guy alive because he always gets to run against somebody who's gonna lose uh, in, a, in a presidential system that assures, I mean, in a set of institutions that assures that. Almost no deputies in the Assemblée Nationale one out of 348 senators, no regional council presidency. I mean, this is an insignificant force in French politics, and this is a pretty appreciable party, right? So that's what we're dealing with at the bottom of that uh, range. Um, but before we throw away these parties and just move on to the other ones and ask what's going on, let's ask the second question. What's the rhetorical adaptation of such a party to this? Um, suppose you're really a small party that doesn't have much hope. And the example I'd like to give, the people down here at the bottom, most of them. So the example I'd like to give is the Alternative for Deutschland, the AFD. Lots of press coverage again. But what's, so you're running the AFD. What's your best play if this is your structural circumstance? Your best play is to become ideologically radical because all you have to work with is your base. You're not getting out of that base. Um, you're going to be frozen out of uh, governments. And that's exactly what we see over time with the AfD. It actually started out more moderate in certain respects than it is now, right? It was a kind of anti-Euro party. And I have to say, with being in Italy, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to people that are a little skeptical about the policy good sense of, of having the Euro. Um, but it got taken over by really much more right-wing people with a much harder edge agenda in a kind of bare knuckled fight over ideology. And all what they're doing is fighting about how to best capture the 10% of the vote share at the far uh, right. In fact, now almost entirely an East German uh, electorate. So that's what we expect rhetorically, the adaptation to this electoral situation um, to be. Now that leaves the rest of the parties that are a little bit bigger and might play a role in politics. So what's the next challenge of dealing with moderates? So, so the, the IFD solution is to just say, um, forget about the moderates, they're gonna run the government, but we're gonna have our little area, we're gonna go into parliament, we're gonna talk a lot and nothing, we're not gonna get anything done, but, but at least we have a good job being a member of the German parliament. So then suppose you're larger and you think, well, I could enter a ruling coalition or even maybe you know, like uh, uh, Salvini, I could run a coalition. Um, then you need to think about how to get more votes and how to convince other people to let you into the coalition and how to convince people to support your policies if you're in the coalition. So, um, and there's quite a bit of experience with this uh, in Europe. Um, probably the country's had the most experience is Austria. Um, and what happens when such parties uh, enter into government is they're up against a very difficult situation. Uh, moderate parties can erect a, a cordon sanitaire against them. I should have a, actually, yeah, this one. So, um, so now we're talking about parties in this range, mostly, and we're talking about how do they um, to seek to um, optimize themselves given their difficult situation. So, um, and so moderate parties often try to exclude uh, these parties. 
moderate parties are more centrally located, so they have more coalition options. Um, and uh, moderate parties might let you into the coalition, but not make any concessions. Um, so the basic truth here is that moderate parties are under the tightest constraints that they are in any circumstance. They are forced to moderate, not just in their actions, but in their rhetoric. Why? Because they need to maintain uh, their acceptability to moderate forces. Um, they're actually thinking about having a larger role in the coalition, so they want to get um, more votes. And this is exactly the situation that you see parties like the Austrian party in, which is they enter in government, they concede everything. So I'll just tell you one anecdote uh, about this. I talked to somebody, let's just say nobody could possibly know what it's like to be in a coalition with the SP or better than this person that I interviewed. And I said, so what happened in the, this, the coalition negotiations? And he said, we agree with you. He said, we went to the FPÖ and I told them, we agree with you already on migration, so that's done. We know you're interested in law and order, so you can send your boys in there to, to help run the police force. And other than that, let us take care of foreign policy. Thank you. That was a negotiation. And uh, because that's all the clout um, uh, that they had, and because they knew if they behaved in a more extreme fashion, uh, they would become um, uh, unacceptable. Uh, much more interesting is the strategic calculations that um, people like Le Pen, Salvini, um, and Maloney make. So, and that is massive moderation. Because now they're thinking, I could be viable, but I then need to move considerably to the moderate center. So Marine Le Pen is a politician, basically to first approximation, moved from being a far-right politician to essentially a center-right politician in, in a decade. Um, scrapped all the rhetoric, um, scrapped being opposed to all the European institutions, um, formally uh, renounced policies that she previously had. And then at the end, which is very characteristic of parties in this position, found her, because they're trying to balance their base against the center, found herself with competition uh, to her right. Um, so that they are fundamentally constrained, trying to fit in to the, exactly this trade-off between moderates and extremists. Um, my favorite example of this um, is your uh, homegrown, you know, Sorella d'Italia here, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Georgia. Um, I read her book. Uh, it was very carefully edited by somebody, I thought. Um, um, but she seems like a really good politician. Um, here she is. Uh, I mean, I like this uh, Jennifer Aniston kind of picture that she's got on the, 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 the front. But she's trying to make herself into a, a totally acceptable person while keeping the base fired up so she can compete for the base with Salvini. And I find it utterly amusing, I guess, maybe because my country is not at stake in this particular fight, um, to watch her try to do it. Um, and what she's good at is, is eliding the difference between rhetoric and reality. But I mean by this the opposite of what most people mean. Um, so when I read most of the criticism of Maloney, it's that she has such nice rhetoric, but it's disguising this kind of crypto fascist self that she really has. Uh, underneath. I think it's the opposite. She has super militant rhetoric that disguises in foreign policy, again, domestic policy, she has more options, but in foreign policy, um, an utterly conventional foreign policy. Um, so what's the rhetoric? The rhetoric is militantly favors a Europe of sovereign states, pro-Christian, pro-Trump, goes and speaks at the conservative conference, national interest, anti-Soros, anti-bankers, with uh, all that implies, recognizes the Italian social movement, criticizes the Azzurri because they have too many foreigners, not part of the Draghi government, wants to blow up NGO boats and all kinds of dog whistle stuff about Mussolini, right? And then you look at her foreign policy. What's Maloney's announced foreign policy? She favors EU membership. She favors the Euro. She wants more U EU, mandatory EU fiscal transfers, more EU security policy, more EU single market, more EU defense, more EU immigration control, more EU research, more EU um, 
in, inward investment, stronger EU or, rules of origin, stronger EU global anti-tax evasion policies, more pro-NATO policies and defense spending, pro-sanctions, pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia, and she wants foreign investment incentives to encourage multinational investment. Like you can't get more mainline, conventional, um, Western foreign policy than that. She is absolutely probably the, the, the true blue um, uh, foreign policy, uh, Western foreign policy supporter. So, and that is disguised by this rhetoric. So I, I actually think the, you know, again, it's a perfect example of the bark, but more than you bite uh, strategy with regard to foreign policy. Now, how she feels about minorities in, in Italy and things like that, separate issue because she faces fewer constraints again in domestic policy. So that's, that's the middle range party. Now, um, the third constraint is that you have to deal with moderates in foreign governments. Um, and this is particularly relevant if we're talking with, about these parties at the top. So these guys don't matter to the first approximation, and most of them have never been in any government. These guys sometimes get in a government, they come, they go, and, and, but they're forced to moderate all the time because they're playing this electoral game and because they need to be acceptable. And that leaves a small group up here. I should say this is a very generous list. So a lot of people, for example, wouldn't put a no in, in the Czech Republic up there. They should move the Czechs down. Um, and so, but, you know, um, there may be three, four, five countries uh, in Europe where there is a significant, there is a significant, significant, um, uh, uh, large party where they have a chance um, to have a majority. I mean, a, a, a majority at least of seats um, and not be under as powerful short-term domestic political party political constraints as, as, they, uh, as the parties we just talked about. Um, notice that that tends to happen in a very specific set of countries. Um, if you look at these top three countries, something that's quite striking about them is that they all have majoritarian or quasi-majoritarian electoral systems, right? And you notice that actually it's pretty hard to get a majority for this party. Um, so the experience of Trump to govern with a, actually a minority, uh, not just and not a plurality, or the British example where you're, you've got 46% of the votes but 67% of the seats is, is typical of parties up there. And again, this insulates them. So they're under less immediate party calculation uh, constraint, but they still face the constraint that they're in a country with um, moderate factions, moderate business interests, blowback from failed policies, other things um, that could lead them to uh, constrain themselves. So in this category, what determines how much happens, all countries do less than you think they're gonna do because they're all under these international constraints, um, but how much less they do depends on how big they are. So it's good old fashioned power. If you're hungry, forget it. You're really not gonna get anything done in international politics because you simply lack the clout. If you're the United States, you have options, right? You can just, and, and that's because you recall, you have two options. You can negotiate or try to impose a solution. Negotiating is pretty tough because these uh, populist regimes are always a minority, um, but uh, you can try it. Uh, and in a few issues, you might get somewhere. Um, but acting unilaterally at least establishes a different status quo for the negotiation. And that's the kind of thing Trump did. So you would expect to see more of this in countries like the UK and the US than in countries like Hungary and Poland. Um, and to see how that works, here I tried to, um, this is the chart you saw before, but in color. Um, so we have the uh, attachment to these EU. So this, ask yourself why the UK seems different. Um, and the UK is different for two reasons. The one is it's relatively Euroskeptic, less Euroskeptic over time. 
Um, but there are few countries where even 21% of the people would say they're not attached to the EU who've ever been members. But more importantly here is the pattern of economic interdependence. So you look at all the other countries that are up there at the top of the list, Hungary, Poland, Czech, Slovenia, and so on. They have enormous levels of FDI and remittance coming in from Europe. They have an enormously asymmetrical trading relationship such that the percentage of their GDP that they export in is far greater, like hundreds of times greater than the amount than it is for the countries that are exporting to them in the EU. This is kind of the classic Cohen and Nye definition of asymmetrical interdependence. And what you see is they just have no chance. I mean, and so that's why you have never heard Orban utter a word about pulling out of the EU because it's, it's a complete non-starter for him and would be perceived as such by Hungarians. In the UK, it's probably not a bright idea to pull out of the EU, but at least you can kind of see how a British person might try to make the case that you could, right? And in the United States, which is a relatively a, a economically non-interdependent country, even more so. So, so here I think size matters. Um, and, um, and that's what we should expect to see. Let me just say like two minutes on exceptional issues and then turn it over to Carlos. So um, here, the, let me just say first, the, here the rhetoric will be freer. So these people are under less immediate electoral constraint, but still some fundamental constraint. Um, so they can talk a lot more. So the best and most uh, wonderful barker but not biter is Orban, a master at the art. I mean, really as good as Maloney might be someday. Um, and he is a master at picking out issues that don't matter and making them into a really big deal while he's more or less um, doing other things in other places. Uh, made a big stink about not letting, just recently made a big stink about not letting weapons, NATO weapons pass to Ukraine and then quietly got rid of almost every aspect of that policy without telling anybody. Um, hundreds of newspaper articles about the first, almost none about the second. Um, and his big issue uh, in recent years was the UN Covenant on Migration, a non-binding General Assembly resolution, uh, which doesn't do anything. It was just a question of whether you voted for it or not. And Orban made a big deal out of that. And he's not the only one. The Dutch government over, almost fell over this issue. Uh, why? Because it has absolutely no consequences, right? The answer is because this is how you bark and don't bite. You need to make a big deal out of something that's that kind of uh, issue. Um, so as we saw before, migration is not an exception to this because all countries are anti-migration in the Western world. Uh, migration quotas are, and again, migration quotas are a wonderful issue for Orban because they're really not as important as people make them out to be. They appear to be symbolically important because the EU has a common policy, but, and I'm happy to talk about this in discussion, um, the number of people who were actually gonna be diverted to other countries and not Germany was quite small through the migration quota system. It's mostly a way of Merkel being able to say that the Europeans are going along with this so the Germans would accept a million migrants. And whether Hungary took its 1,100 migrants or not really is of no broader geopolitical consequence. But boy, Orban played it for all it was worth, held a referendum, did everything he could. So he's an expert at this high rhetoric to disguise the fact that actually he doesn't have uh, so much power. Finally, Brexit. Uh, and um, so uh, Brexit, I treat as an exception that proves the rule. What do we mean in social science when we say it's an exception that proves the rule? We mean um, one of two things. Uh, we either mean it's an outlier, and as we've already seen, Britain is an outlier, right? It has more radical views that are Eurosceptic and less interdependent connection with Europe than any other country is in a category to try. But it also means something else, which is even within that category, um, Brexit really is one of those things where when you trace through the process, you think this was such an unlikely thing to happen, even in Britain. Um, the number of things that had to happen of, of a, a prime minister making strategic mistakes, um, 
a, a, a holding a referendum he didn't have to hold. After all, Tony Blair promised a referendum, didn't hold it. Um, mismanaging the campaign by allowing his cabinet ministers to, to campaign against it. Um, avoiding by the skin of his teeth, one vote after the other. Then there's an election uh, and the election happens to be to pit an extremely talented political entrepreneur, Boris Johnson, against the least popular labor, labor government and labor party in 75 years. Um, and the referendum itself was held at the only time in the last five years when a majority of British opposed being members of the EU. I mean, a number of, of, of things that had to go just a certain way for this to happen, I think are very high. So, you know, social science isn't perfect. Um, none of these generalizations are perfect, but I think you can see this was pretty unlikely and it's not gonna happen again because the first thing that happened when other countries looked at it is they said, we're not trying this and all discussion of Frexit and Utel exit and so on disappeared. So um, we can talk about Trump in the um, question period. I think the theory fits it perfectly, but the conclusion I draw is basically um, foreign policy successes vary, is, is rare for these parties. It varies in a very systematic way. And that systematic way is, a, is explained by very conventional undergraduate theories of political competition, um, national interest in, in interdependence and um, power. And that these people's primary skill is the skill with which they manipulate rhetoric to help themselves and disguise the fact that they're not uh, delivering anything. Uh, but all of them um, bark more than they bite. Uh, the large parties bark a lot and seldom bite. The medium-sized parties don't bark very much and don't bite very much. And the small parties bark a whole ton but never get into government so they can't deliver anything. Um, and that's the story. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, this excellent uh, lecture. And um, so we can now open the floor to questions and comments. So please uh, tell us uh, who you are. And uh, I will uh, start by collecting, say, about three questions. Uh, and and then, uh, then maybe we'll uh, go on with single questions. The first is from uh, our friend, Isaac. Thank you for your uh, very stimulating presentation. Uh, I'm Emanuele Massetti from the School of International Studies. Um, uh, I have two questions, com comments, questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, um, the title of your presentation, uh, which um, um, it is more about a comparison between um, right-wing populist parties or governments and non-right-wing populist parties or, or governments. And uh, I found that probably you conducted research on this, but in your presentation, there was a missing aspect. And uh, if you could present uh, evidence or just talk about the differences in achievements between uh, right-wing populist parties governments and not right-wing populist parties governments that would uh, completely control for the uh, let's say international capacity of the country that you are considering. Um, the, the second uh, question is about um, um, the success or the achievements of some uh, right-wing populist governments in Europe, particularly uh, Hungary and Poland. And as you said, these are countries that in theory um, should, uh, should not have much power in uh, intra-EU negotiations because they uh, are not uh, big countries compared to others. They are net recipients vis-a-vis -vis the EU budget. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, aren't you downplaying too much the fact that they managed to veto the, the redistribution of quota on migration and they are resisting on the rule of law? Uh, 
Um, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I would like to push you a little bit on the issue of Brexit. Um, I was wondering uh, whether and to what extent you see the um, Eurosceptic shift of the British Conservative Party as a consequence of UKIP's sort of banging on Europe to quote David Cameron, namely whether you see it as more as an inner process that the party uh, you know, experienced because of an underlying change in public opinion, or whether you see this kind of dynamics, you know, more related to this rise of a competitor on the right, that also because of the first past the post system, generated a number of challenges and practical problems for the Tories. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Andrea Fracasso, School of International Studies. Thank you for, for the lecture. Um, I was wondering, um, when you talk about foreign policy about European countries, and you refer so much about European politics, it seems that the rest of the world doesn't matter to a certain extent. So my feeling is that in a number of European countries where these parties had a, a large role, we got quite peculiar position with China, for instance. Uh, the, uh, 17 plus one club. In the United States were quite, you know, concerned about this uh, gradual shift of Europe some European countries towards China. So I guess there are a number of other uh, cases in point. So I was wondering whether focusing only on uh, being the EU and pro EU uh, or pro NATO are two large issues to have anyone being particularly effective. Um, I would say that even moderates don't have any policy line about that. We simply stick to the, you know, to the past and we continue. Sorry, part of the policy line about what? I mean, about you I mean, being the EU, uh, so EU in, EU out, or NATO in, NATO out. Uh, but there are other foreign policy issues that are a bit more subtle, uh, gradual, and things have happened, uh, I think, also because of the populist past. Like China. Okay, so I'm not forgetting you, but uh, maybe let's get an answer to these three first questions. Um, these are good. Uh, so, um, we agree on the fact on the on the question of Poland and Hungary's successes. Um, we agree on the fact that there are a few successes and we agree what they are, right? There's rule of law, there's migration quotas. Um, and so the, the, the question is how you interpret that. So our position is that there are specified exceptions where such parties have to really fight no matter what the cost. One is something that threatens the um, but by, by the original theory where party survival and survival in government is the number one thing, anything that's, that threatens the sitting government is going to be something that the government resists. So it resists rule of law uh, imposition. It's worth pointing out that that's, it's not like you're resisting something that already existed in the EU. You're resisting something that was created to try directed right at you. But it seems to me almost tautological that they will um, oppose that and use as much as they can uh, uh, as power as they can uh, to try to oppose it. Um, in the short term, they can slow it down. Um, whether or not you think in the long term that's um, successful, I think is, is unclear. Migration quote as my position, I think was clear. I think they're irrelevant. I mean, I really think to, to talk about migration quotas and redistribution of migrations, I know in Italy, it's a very fraught issue. Um, but the number of people we're talking about is tiny, right? We're talking about a few tens of thousands. Um, and um, uh, every country in Eastern Europe, um, regardless of whether uh, they had a far right party even existed, like take Lithuania, had the same position. The only difference was Hungary said, we won't even take the first thousand. Lithuania said, we'll take a thousand and then that's it. Right, so these are positions that are not driven.
primarily um, by the uh, far right party position. They're driven by the political economic situation of the country. Um, and they are relatively insignificant. That policy arose in my interpretation because Germany was going to take 80% of the migrants and German politicians felt they needed political cover. Now, if you think one of the purposes, and I do think this, one of the purposes of the political un European Union is to give political cover to politicians who want to do this kind of thing, then this is a real effect. So I'm not denying that that's true. I'm just saying in the broader substantive scheme, it's relatively um, insignificant. And why migration, right? Migration is unique among almost all the issues we talked about because it's salient in the minds of the electorate. And the, and the strongest saliency is on the side of the anti-migration uh, people. So whatever we decide about migration quotas, their importance and so on, we can stipulate two things. It doesn't apply to the exclusion of migrants, which is a completely consensual policy. And it's not generalizable to other issues because those other issues aren't salient. So in my view, I totally agree these are exceptions, but I, I make less uh, of them. Um, on uh, Brexit, I don't disagree with your story about um, uh, what happens in majoritarian political systems and the incentives that are created for, for larger parties. Um, I'm not interested, or let's just say I'm not studying um, why parties take positions. I'm stipulating that parties take positions and trying to figure out what they do as a consequence of it. So in a sense, it's not my problem, but it's consistent with the analysis in that I pointed out majoritarian political systems are politically prone, particularly prone to this. And I, because they, they essentially precisely because of the analysis that we've been discussing, which is they place the moderate right faction in a completely different position than the moderate right faction in a proportional representation system because that faction then needs to decide either I'm gonna vote against any government that I'm involved in. Um, and you know, in the United States, it puts Mitch McConnell in the position of saying either I'm gonna vote democratic or I'm gonna support Trump. And it's not a difficult choice for him. So I totally agree that that takes place. So to, to get around even discussing that because it's been so well discussed by so many people in the literature, I just code the Conservative Party as a Euroskeptic, uh, sorry, as a as a popular as a uh, extreme right populist party. Probably that's not true, and I actually put an asterisk on the chart to indicate that I knew it wasn't true. Since, but um, but that was a way of just saying let's get past that issue and then see what the Conservative Party actually uh, does. Okay, thanks very much. We can now move on to a second round of questions. Uh, here is the first question. Thank you. Sebastian Oberteur of the Flemish Free University of Brussels. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, I guess my overarching theme is, um, is looking back as you've done good for predicting the future. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering, I am see where you're coming from, from a liberal intergovernmentalist uh, perspective, I guess, uh, assuming rationality of actors and assuming EU policy is foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I see some problems with that. So with the rationality, well, rationally we would have predicted that Putin doesn't invade Ukraine, right? So sometimes things seem to be non-rational and there's increasing talk about post-factual communication, which we see a lot, et cetera. So can we assume that this will continue like this? When you talk about EU policy as foreign policy and just migration policy, is that really foreign policy? The rule of law, is that foreign policy? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, especially you have then all, all the things, the topics and the rule of law is fundamental and can change the overall picture, right? Um, so I'm wondering again, if, if the rule of law discussion continues like this, um, will, will we see a changed future in this? Um, so, but, but overall, I guess my guiding question is, will we kind of see more exceptions from the rule in the future? We're we taking one at a time now, or? Okay. 
Yes, I'm Giorgio Fodor. I used to teach here. I'm an economist. Um, there is a, a curious situation now with the right that the traditional attraction of the right was the fear of the left. And now we don't have a left. So this changes dramatically, I think, the um, role of the right because it can monopolize disaffection with the present state of affairs. And uh, if you look at different, um, how people vote geographically, you see that people in the Maastricht referendum, geographically, the vote against Maastricht was very similar to what the vote for Le Pen is now. <clears throat> And in most countries, you have the affluent sections, which are basically cities, which vote in a rather traditional way, and the rest of the country, which is left behind, <clears throat> vote, has a protest vote. Now, the only country where <clears throat> the protest vote seems to have some importance now is France. <clears throat> but I think that with the current economic situation worsening, and we have seen lots of discussion about how this <clears throat> crisis with the Ukraine war will aff could affect political equilibrium in Russia. We have not seen enough about how the present crisis, and it's worsening now, <clears throat> economic crisis, can change political equilibrium in Western Europe. Because if the <clears throat> only place where people who are dissatisfied with the present situation is the right, they will vote to the right. And politicians, what they present to the electorate is what they think the electorate wants. Roosevelt, he went to, <clears throat> he achieved power, in, he was in favor of a balanced budget. When he got into power in a very difficult situation, he took totally different, um, <clears throat> policies. So um, I think that the right has a dramatically <clears throat> favorable situation now. And I'm not sure that what they would do um, if they get in power would be so moderate as in the present situation. That's it. Uh, so I would like your comments on this. Thank you. Maybe we get to answer with these two. Okay. Well, um, two two of them are great, and the two are the sub questions are the same, which is like, what's going to happen in the future? Um, I'll just tell you a story. When I was first um, at uh, as a junior faculty member at Harvard, uh, the most respected member of the faculty, a political philosopher who lived through the Holocaust and everything, Judith Sklar, um, brilliantly incisive mind. She took every junior faculty member to lunch, so like I showed up at the Harvard Faculty Club and lunch for Judith Sklar, and she looks at me and says, what are you studying? You know, so I said, well, European integration, stuff like that. She frowned. She said, um, well, don't try to predict the future because Joseph Nye, when he was a junior faculty member, he tried to, tried to predict the future and it almost cost him tenure at Harvard University. So I've always been skeptical about predicting uh, the future too much. Um, but, you know, I think we have a pretty long track record with these parties. I mean, people forget that exactly half of the parties on the list that I put on the board have been in power. Um, some of them been in part of more than once. Um, they had more support uh, five or 10 years ago than they do now, five years ago than they do now. And they may have somewhat more support uh, in the future. Um, and yet over time, despite this variation in support, we see this consistent trend. Um, now you might say, well, this is all coincidence. Maybe it is, you know, nobody can predict the future, but this gets to the issue of rationality. 
Um, what interests me about them, besides, um, you know, that they're less of a threat than I might have thought, except in the U.S. and the U.K., which is a problem, right? But the, what interests me about them is I see them as very cleverly, but in an unorthodox fashion, rational. It's the it's the cleverness with which people like Orban or Maloney manipulate rhetoric that's interesting. I mean, these are not people who are stupid. And they 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 are trying things out, but it's I never get the feeling when I watch either of them give a speech that they're just like throwing stuff out there because they're kind of expressing themselves. They have a very clear political purpose and they pick issues in ways to try to generate political support. So I see these people as, you know, to have played as bad a hand as they have and done relatively as well as they have, you know, shows a lot of skill. Um, much like I teach undergraduates about Adolf Hitler. You know, if you, if you think the explanation for Adolf Hitler is he was completely crazy and crazy people shouldn't run countries, you vastly underestimate the threat, right? The threat from Hitler is this person has extreme goals, but he's an unbelievably good tactician. <laughs> and so I'm analyzing these people this way. And I think when you look at the process evidence, there's a tremendous amount of evidence for that. And even people who are undeniably erratic, like Trump, you know, just like doing stuff right and left, it's amazing when you trace issues through that they, they they are capable of more consistent focus than you might think, like Afghanistan. I mean, Trump has an argument, which evidently Joe Biden agrees with, that United States should not have been in Afghanistan. He, he really cared about it. His arguments about why we shouldn't be in Afghanistan, United States shouldn't be in Afghanistan were more or less correct. Uh, you know, you're fighting a war you can't win, and what are we doing here? And, um, and he pursued it and pursued it and pursued it against opposition until he got it. And so I'm, I, I have more confidence than you do in these people's rationality. I think the case studies really bear it out. Okay, thanks very much. We have a question here. We take one at a time now. I am Ricardo Rigon. I am an outlayer. Ricardo Rigon. I am an outlayer because I am an engineer. <laughs> so um, in your analysis, it, it looks like that the, the moderate parties or the moderate people plays a, a fundamental role. Mm -hmm. But um, is not that maybe uh, this group of people or voters or parties are going to be disappeared in some conditions. And so the whole analysis more or less can be changed. Um. That's unlikely. Um, so, you know, my analysis is in its essence no different than what um, um, Daniel Ziblatt and Steve Levitsky, two scholars at Harvard, said about the Weimar Republic, um, which was it all depended on the accommodating behavior of the moderates that Hitler could get as far as he did. And Hitler could never get to 50%. For that, he needed to degrade the, I mean, essentially stage a coup. Um, and I don't think it's by chance in precisely as the gentleman in the back was saying in these majoritarian systems where you have this um, uh, tension, although I agree with the gentleman in the back that um, it, in the Weimar Republic case, that was also driven by fear of the extreme left, right? But, but that you, you place the moderate right in this difficult position. And once you grab power, your incentive is to try to lock it in with electoral bias, lock it in with force, lock it in with all these things. So it's not by chance that you see somebody like Orban trying to undermine rule of law. It's not by chance that you see this in the United States because that's, that's a set of motivations that, that the moderate right will support in these countries that they don't support um, elsewhere. So I, I don't think that they're, I think in all cases, we were faced with this same set of um, trade-offs, but these party factions, so these party factions and this um, negotiation of the terms of the alliance between the kind of globalized, um, uh, more moderate sector of the economy and the people who described as being left behind in the 
and the extremists is eternal. I mean, it's been around for so long that I have a hard time imagining what the changes in the political economy and ideological structure of a country would have to be to get rid of it, right? I mean, there's st and it's still true that the moderates are essentially the dominant faction in most countries. I mean, if, if I look at my own country, the United States, and I say what I'm worried about, I'm not worried about the Trump people. I really aren't. I'm worried about the moderate right. And I'm not worried about the moderate right because I think they're gonna adopt Trump's views. I think the moder I'm worried about the moderate right because I think they're libertarian. And if they're libertarians, they're gonna drive taxes down and they're gonna essentially destroy the welfare state in the United States. That's their agenda. Trump's just a tool for them. You know? So not only do I think that it's, uh, if, it, it, I don't think that, that it's, um, these people are likely to disappear. I think they dominate the politics of many countries. So I'm, I'm more sanguine than you are. I don't, I don't fear this slide of everybody to the extreme uh, right, rather than what you're gonna see is the extreme right coming to meet them halfway. And the interesting thing, for example, with Maloney that I, I look at in that case is I think, okay, she's, her, her appeal is really interesting because it's not a libertarian appeal. It's a social welfareist appeal combined with the nationalist view. And so the question will be, what will be the real policy result for that moderate middle where you've got some people who probably are more favored, or, you know, more free market and more lower taxes agenda? Does that answer your question? You don't seem sure. <clears throat> okay, we, um, we need to begin to draw this very interesting talk to a close, but um, Maybe just let me ask you a couple of very quick comments on, on, on a few things and then, and then we'll finish. J just very, very quickly, um, I, I basically agree with your um, um, line of explanation that, um, you know, these uh, parties don't achieve very much. Just, uh, um, just I would add a few uh, variables that are already there in, in your talk, but maybe you could comment on them a little bit. One is that, uh, um, in, in the international arena, there is a constant uh, and, 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 and long-lasting division between these parties. Some are pro-Russian, mm. some are not. You know? And this is something that is structural and that uh, weakens this party family. And, and I can't see that uh, they can overcome these divisions. Uh, in fact, uh, the divisions are becoming even stronger now. Even the, the famous Visegrad group is, is splitting up after the Ukrainian war. and. Um, that's one. The second is that, again, these parties uh, are traditionally and typically split on lifestyle issues, with some of them being more conservative in terms of lifestyles, typically the, the southern ones and the eastern ones, and some of them being more, uh, more open, like, for instance, uh, uh, pro-gay, you know, we had the Pink Fortune group, uh, you know, the Netherlands and, and uh, the Scandinavians, and, and that again is something that uh, will remain uh, 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 with this party family for a long time and makes uh, alliances very difficult. And third, although, you know, that doesn't square very much with some of, uh, you know, your approaches, um, the, um, uh, the fact is that in the international arena, um, uh, the strength of some countries depends upon the support of other countries. And there's, if you think about Orban, you talked about Orban. Orban was uh, empowered very much by the fact that he's in the popular party and that uh, the Germans needed it and then tolerated some of the violations to the rule of law that he perpetrated for many years now. They're changing their mind now a little bit, but, uh, but uh, the reality is that these kind of uh, conflicts and, and tensions will come back again. So maybe just a couple of quick questions, uh, comments on these, these, uh, these three. Well, issues. I just want to share, I skipped over this because I didn't want to take up question time, but this is, it speaks to your point about the fact that the far right parties don't agree amongst themselves. Um, and the interesting thing I think about this particular disagreement where Italy wants people, wants to share migrants and Hungary doesn't want to take migrants is that it can, it, it, um, is perfectly predicted, right, by the conventional political economy view about, you know, it's all about the costs and benefits of managing interdependence, right? And when you have an exogenous shock that changes the terms of, of international interdependence, be it political or economic, um, then countries decide what their interests are and align that way. And uh, a surprising number of these far-right parties disagree amongst themselves 
on precisely these issues. The euro is another issue on which they disagree. It should be, should it be, you know, more permissive or less permissive? So uh, I, I absolutely think that the external constraint here also works this way, that even these parties can't ignore it. And that, again, speaks to this eternal importance of of the traditional factors that we thought explained what countries do in these areas, which is um, uh, the political economic interests of the countries um, filtered through the, the parties that are um, uh, governing them. So, um, and the rest of your points, I, uh, yeah, I definitely agree. Thanks very much for coming, Andrew, and uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. By the way, I'm writing. Aspetto che entra. No, ce l'ho qua. Be careful. Aspetta. So, good morning, everybody. I sorry, I'll take this off for, for the introduction. So, good morning, everybody. I'm Andrea Fracasso. I'm a, a member of the Student International Studies. I'm uh, glad to to uh, greet you for the beginning of the second part of this uh, second day after the great lecture by Andrew. Um, so the, the the school decided to uh, dedicate the second part of the day of the of the morning to a panel uh, to a round table actually uh dedicated to european uh issues um so if you want the european union uh in the first decades of its history has focused a lot on internal issues uh particularly on completing the internal market in uh, uh completing the in institutional settings and uh and for this reason, um, if you like, the, the, uh, a number of internal policies and external policies had to coordinate towards this goal. In particular, uh, take competition policy. Well, the point was to avoid the emergence of policies and um, decisions by the states that could segment the market. Um, and this inward looking approach of the EU uh, policy making has uh, lasted for long and was you know, connected also with the uh, support that the EU has always uh, uh, given to the uh, multilateral system, WTO uh, or the GATS before, and the international liberal order based on rules because they were uh, you know, matching together. Uh, in, in terms of foreign policy, well, we got some bandwagoning with the US, so sometimes member states went uh, each one on different directions, and sometimes the EU was simply irrelevant. Um, uh, things have 
changed recently and probably the pandemic, the fight to climate change, and also the war in Ukraine uh, did push this trend further. So uh, the EU now starts to uh, look for a place in the multipolar order, uh, remaining a champion of the multilateral system, but at the same time trying to defend its own interest, to define its own interests. Actually, we had a discussion at the school in the past and some of our colleagues and some scholars more in general argue that perhaps the European Union can find its unity and also its identity in the definition of its external policy. Uh, so this idea of having a global uh, uh, commission, no? the, this um, uh, attention to global issues uh, by the commission. And this is touching upon, however, a number of policies that typically are internal policies. Again, if we consider a competition policy, to make an example, uh, the idea that we have to allow European, European companies to, became, to become large enough to compete with uh, Asian or American companies uh, is going to require a revision of the uh, competition policy as we know it. Uh, if we want a defense policy, we need a foreign policy. Um, Strategic autonomy is, uh, is a buzzword, but uh, what it implies and what it entails is more complicated to define. And of course, the EU has to find a position in the world in, in, in nearby areas as well. Uh, the promotion of environmental protection of human rights, uh, they are certainly important, but this requires the adoption of sex restricting measures that are affecting member states and are affecting companies. So uh, again, this uh, connection between internal and external policy becomes uh, very, very important. So the question that uh, I suppose the panel in general will address is whether Europe will become a global player, whether this will um, help uh, to um, preserve or even improve the internal unity and to give identity to, to, uh, the, uh, to the union. So before introducing to you all the guests that we have at the table today, and I, I would like to thank for agreeing to participate in the, in the, in the, in the round table, uh, I would like just to point out how this, this topic is central, important for the School of International Studies. First of all, because it puts together EU policy and international affairs. Secondly, because to deal with the issues that I mentioned, you need multidisciplinary approach and people that can talk to each other and share uh, knowledge. Uh, there are issues like environmental law, international trade, European and global governance, human rights, international law, international security, foreign policy, social movements, electoral studies, international history, development policy, energy policy, you name it. I try to do my best, but you name it, there are many more. Uh, and, so, and this is what uh, the, the School of International Studies is meant and also suited to do, uh, as many other institutions, of course. So the panel, I think, it represents well, as you will hear in a second, uh, understanding the, also the background uh, of the, 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 the speakers. Uh, so the, this panel represents well the school uh, to a certain extent to celebrate these 20 years. So let me start in alphabetical order, clearly, to introduce you the, the speaker. And I start with uh, Sondra Faccio right at my right and side uh, she's an assistant professor in international law uh, at the school of international study and the faculty of law at the university of trento she works on international investment and trade law among other uh, topics uh, we have uh, sebastiano berardo uh, right on the right um, he's the director of the research center for environment economy and energy and the research professor for environment and sustainable development at the brussels school of governance is also a position at the university of eastern Finland. Mallory Schoss is a research fellow at CEPS, the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, uh, where she's the coordinator of the Hidden Treasure Program and the Task Force on the New Industrial Strategy for Europe. Vitek Strikti uh, is Associate Professor in International Security and is a Head of Department of Security Studies at the Charles University in Prague, and you know that is a partner in the INSIS program of the school. Uh, his expertise lies in the interface between security and technology, and uh, finally, last but not least, Umberto Tulli, who is assistant professor of contemporary history at the School of International Studies. And uh, his interest covers human, uh, human rights history, Cold War history, and the history of transatlantic relations. This is particularly relevant for this uh, panel. Uh, again, thank you everybody for uh, coming over and for long trips in some cases, <laughs> uh, it's very appreciated. So let me, let me start with the, the first round of questions that um, uh, will help us to address the, the, the issues that I mentioned uh, a second ago. So first of all, I would like to start with Mallory. 
uh, if that is okay. Um, so the, the EU uh, participates uh, actively in the debates regarding the reform of the WTO. Um, and this is clearly connected with a number of, of policies that I mentioned at the beginning, competition policy, but even more the industrial policy and clearly the trade policy review. So could you help us to understand the connection and to identify what are the, the, the most important issues to appreciate the evolution of the EU and the in the WTO reform discussion and trade policy more in general? Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Fracasso, first for inviting me here to celebrate with us the 20th anniversary of the School of International Studies of the University of Trento. I'm very honored. Uh, and first of all, of course, congratulations. Now, I will be discussing, as you said, the future of Europe as a global trade player and taking through the lenses of the new industrial strategy for Europe. And this strategy has been released by the Commission a bit more than two years ago in March 2020. And my intervention is essentially based on research that is carried out as part of the SEPS task force, now called Forum, that is specifically dedicated to this strategy. Now, in February of last year, so in the wake of this new industrial strategy for Europe, the Commission also released its EU trade policy review, which is called an open, sustainable and assertive mm -hmm. trade policy. And its very foundation is to be found in this broad and overarching concept of open strategic autonomy, which is promoted exactly by the new industrial strategy for Europe to, um, to, um, uh, with respect to the EU's external relations. Now to grasp the scope and content of this broad concept with respect specifically to the EU trade policy, one has first to understand the traditional foundation of EU trade policy, that is openness. But one has importantly also to understand the, uh, the challenges that this EU trade policy is currently facing and most, more broadly the rules-based multilateral trading system. And why? Because those challenges, they call for reconsideration of practices that have designed globalization over the past decades and it calls also, therefore, for the reconsideration of the EU trade policy towards sustainability and greater assertiveness. Now, the first challenge is therefore the green transition. The green transition and the required improvement of the contribution of EU trade policy and more broadly all trade policies towards non-economic objectives. And the second challenge relates, so as I am framing it, relates to the global level playing field and the issue of competitive neutrality, which is based on the coexistence or, uh, the, or better even the convergence of different types of economic systems. And I'm referring here in particular to the economic systems where the state is heavily involved in the economy, the related lack of transparency in trade practices that may lead to competitive distortions. And there, this challenge is in particular heavy for us because it has domino effects with this issue of weaponization of rules. That's to say that more and more countries mm -hmm. are having recourse to, uh, to unilateral measures that may be to some extent protectionist. And here I'm referring to at the EU level to the greater assertiveness that the EU is actually putting in its trade policy against unfair trade practices. Now, based on our research, the best approach to tackle all those challenges, sustainability, and also the issue of convergence of uh, economic systems would be at the multilateral level, would be the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the rules-based multilateral trading system. Mm -hmm. However, as we know, the WTO and its main governance pillars have lost uh, in dynamic these past years. But what we argue is that the challenges that undermine the system should actually be seized as opportunities to reestablish trust in the system and to, uh, to reconfirm its centrality because it has proven effective over the past decades for a stable global economy and for the maintenance of peace. And in this respect, the EU has a key global leadership role 
to play because not only it's the world's largest trading bloc, but it's also a strong advocate of multilateralism that's really in the DNA of the EU. Now, the WTO reform process is going to be a long and difficult process, which will have to take place in stages, starting now with uh, the, uh, the WTO uh, ministerial conference that is opening on Sunday. But for this to happen in the medium and long term, the members, uh, the, mem the members of the WTO, including the EU, have to be creative. Creative respect to negotiating approaches, so not just multilateralism, but also plurilateralism, and also creative as to, uh, uh, as to the WTO dispute settlement system. And beyond now, tackling those issues of sustainable trade and unfair trade. So sustainable trade, the EU has a key global leadership role to play there based on its green uh, deal and at the multilateral level we see a positive dynamic with a number of initiatives that are undertaken uh, and in which the eu is part of all of them so here i'm referring for instance to the negotiations for a multilateral agreement on harmful fisheries subsidies most probably you have heard about it and it's close to be uh, adopted but there are also more li limited discussion on inefficient fossil fuel subsidies that have to be uh, phased out. And ideally, the environmental goods agreement negotiations should be, uh, should be uh, revived. So they have been suspended in 2016, but studies show that import tariffs, that's really the core business of the WTO, are higher on cleaner industries compared to dirtier uh, industries. Now, in parallel to those negotiations and more formal discussions, there are also informal discussions, such as the informal dialogue on plastics pollution, which is, as the Deputy Director General Pogan says, one of the most uh, important environmental issues that are discussed now at the WTO. Now, the WTO contribution there would be strengthened transparency in support of the current negotiations that are happening at the EU for having a legally binding uh, agreement by 2024 to end all this plastic pollution. Now, I'm referring a bit to what uh, Sandra Fatcher is going to, uh, to tell you as well, is that the EU is active at the multilateral level, but also at the lower governance uh, levels. And till recently, the EU's main perspective so a main perspective on sustainable uh, trade has been to integrate trade and sustainable development chapters in its new generation of free trade agreement. And now also at the autonomous unilateral level, the EU is quite active with respect to sustainable trade. And there I'm referring, for instance, to the recent commission's proposal for a directive on due diligence. And so given the positive dynamic at the multilateral level, these actions at the bilateral or unilateral level should actually be strengthened to, uh, to uh, make uh, those multilateral solutions happen. Now, regarding fair trade, which is more, uh, a more delicate uh, issue, the most appropriate approach would be, of course, also multilateralism and their strengthening the disciplines on subsidies or on state-owned enterprises at the WTO with the objective to limit as much as possible those un uh, unfair practices and also limit the escalation in the weaponization of rules. Now, given the overall context of low fare, it's a domain where the multilateral action is far more under, uh, far more under tension, but, but, and so has to rely on the other lower governance uh, levels. And for this, the EU has also an important role to play based first on its bilateral trade agreements and relevant disciplines, for instance, that, that you can find on state-owned enterprises, but also based on its autonomous uh, measures, as I'm going to explain. So first of state-owned enterprises, the most reasonable approach would be an international code of conduct in this respect. And their substantial progress could be achieved in the medium term because there is some convergence when we look at the different agreements, bilateral and regional agreements, we see that there is some convergence among the three main players, economic players, so the EU, US, uh, and China in, uh, in this respect. Now, 
If we look at the modern, broader modernization of the WTO rules uh, on, uh, on subsidies, there it's a far more long-term issue that China is blocking because it covers notably the issue of industrial subsidies. And in any event, before we can strengthen the rules on subsidies at the WTO level, more analytical work is needed for having a common understanding of the effects of subsidies and also of their uh, motivations. Now, in the meantime, what can help shape those disciplines? Notably, autonomous measures, such as, as I mentioned, the Commission's proposal on foreign subsidies, which even if it's part of a framework of uh, greater assertiveness of the EU against unfair trading practices, it may also be an important laboratory to develop a better knowledge on those subsidies that could help shape the multilateral discipline. So to conclude quickly, uh, the recent EU trade policy review of last year has been adopted following and in line with the EU industrial strategy. This bringing together confirms first the very foundation of EU trade policy, which is openness, but it also calls for its reorientation towards sustainability and greater assertiveness. Now, the risk of bringing together industry and trade is, of course, the issue of protectionism and geopoliticization of EU trade policy. So is this really the case? The risk is there, there is a risk, but we see that this concept, overarching concept of open strategic autonomy, as it is applied to the EU trade policy, seems to translate signs of some form of reconciliation between economics and politics. So distancing from protectionism, but the road is long, and so vigilance remains crucial. And why am I saying that there are some signs of reconciliation? Because we see that the multilateral dynamic on sustainable trade is quite positive. On fair trade, the multilateral dynamic is more under tension, but it can, it can lead to some multilateral breakthrough in the medium term on state-owned enterprises. And measures such as the Commission's proposal on foreign subsidies can help shape those multilateral, uh, these multilateral disciplines. And we are actually confirmed in our, uh, in our analysis based on the recent actions by the EU in times of hypercrisis. I mean, the war and the necessary sanctions that are adopted. What, so there is a real risk there of a greater fragmentation of uh, world trade with the emergence of geopolitical uh, blocks, but even advancing in this context so of, deli of a delicate rich line, the EU's response seems to be proportionate based on a proactive cooperation and multilateralism. We see a constellation of cooperation initiatives by the EU, be it with India, with the US, but also with China currently. And this should not be actually a surprise, given that the principles that are at the foundation of the EU are also those at the foundation of the EU common commercial policy, free fair trade, sustainable development, the rule of law, multilateral cooperation, and peace. And those principles are firmly grounded in the European treaties, and if you look correctly, also firmly grounded in the GATT and the WTO covered agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Manly. Um, I think that you open directly the 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 the, the, the floor for uh for sebastian actually not sandra um no yeah i know you already but just we take a break from that um because you mentioned so many times sustainable and so clear clearly the 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 issue with the reduction of carbon emissions protection of the environment and and biodiversity is there and and european union has put together this european green deal that everybody knows a little bit about but not much so uh, Sebastian knows a lot about it, and so he can perhaps help us to understand also the relationship this EU Green Deal uh, with internal and external policy and institutions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, yes. So I think um, 
I'll broadly have three points to elaborate on, um, and the third one will be pretty brief. Um, the, the, the first question kind of was, does the European Green Deal have the potential to unify the EU also as a global player? And since the question then would be about potential, my um, answer would be yes. Uh, especially then obviously in the fields of climate and energy and broader sustainability, although with respect to the latter, the broader sustainability agenda, perhaps um, the, the conclusion is a little bit more ambiguous. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that in this field of climate, energy, sustainability, there's a very, very close connection between the domestic internal policy and the external policy and position of the EU in the world. Because a lot of um, the standing of the EU, also of its successes in the past in international climate policy, in external energy policy, to the extent there are um, successes in the latter, uh, are then based on common development of domestic policies, because that has usually a unifying uh, effect, especially if the policies are relatively progressive vis-a-vis -vis the outside world, that once you have these progressive policies, the EU is united and pushing them also internationally. Um, so um, since the European Green Deal tries to advance that agenda of the internal policy development, that can then so, um, be assumed to have a positive effect also on the uh, external position. Um, and what the Green Deal then does is to actually also have included the aspiration that the environmental, the sustainability, the climate agenda gets mainstreamed, integrated, whatever you call it, in all kinds of other policy areas, internally as well as externally. We already heard a little bit about trade and the aspiration is obviously to integrate it fully into the, the, the trade agenda, although I think there's still some way to go there. Um, so that's the aspiration of the Green Deal to integrate it into trade, to integrate it into agriculture, into innovation policies, into the industrial strategy, and it's part of that, um, and, and make this fully coherent. And obviously that has a lot of potential, um, and that has even more potential when you think about the current situation that we are in, Ukraine, Russia, uh, the, the energy dependence, insecurity that has been revealed by that. Um, in that respect, perhaps um, a, a little elaboration on the climate agenda and what that might mean for strategic autonomy of the EU in the, in the longer term. Um, as you know, under the Green Deal, we have, um, the EU has adopted uh, the, the targets of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases by 55% by 2030 and to become fully climate neutral by 2050, meaning net emissions would be uh, reduced to zero. Um, and we have looked a little bit at what that means for the geopolitical position of the EU, because we all know that the EU is currently very much dependent on uh, imports of gas, oil, and even coal. Um, and what, what the result would be of climate neutrality. Obviously, it would result, first of all, in a drastic, dramatic reduction of imports of these fossil fuels. Um, but then there's a lot in the literature also that we would become more dependent on the imports of other products, rare earths, other materials that you need actually for the uh, build up of renewable energy and alternative um, technologies such as batteries, etc. But when you look at that, a little bit in closer detail, then you see that actually um, the external dependence that comes with that is of a totally different magnitude. And that means much, much less. It's first of all dispersed across a number of different materials. So there is not like these are the three big ones and we need them. It's a number of materials that are used in different areas and are coming from different places in the world. So if one of them falls away, okay, a certain part of the economy will be affected, but it's a much smaller part than if you suddenly stop gas imports or anything like that. For many of these products, you have substitutes that you can put in there. 
um, uh, the economic importance of them overall is of, of a different nature. If you stop fossil fuel in, imports, kind of the co economy uh, grins to a halt, right? At some point, we have some reserves, etc. With the other ones, it's kind of okay, we can't deploy ploy as quickly as we thought solar panels and windmills and batteries, but the economy keeps going, right? Uh, on, on the basis of what's already out there. So it's pretty different. And thirdly, you have a lot of policy options to actually address this, uh, this import dependence by uh, pushing forward the circular economy, recycling, et cetera, to actually get to a situation where you will need less of these imports. So in terms of strategic autonomy in this energy field, um, I, I think uh, the EU is on a good route there and, and uh, becoming must, much more autonomous. Obviously, in a time frame of, let's say, 10, 20, 25 years. Um, so that, that looks good, right? Second point is, well, number of challenges and problems. Because the European Green Deal is a strategy. So first of all, it needs to be implemented. Uh, and that is where then some of the problems arise, right? Um, there are, this is not insured, there are challenges with that. Um, again, mo many of the challenges actually are then in the domestic policy field. Uh, but as I explained, that's important for the external role of the EU as well. Um, there's increasing contestation. Of, because of the social dimension of the distributional effects that we have with the climate and energy transition, that who's going to pay, right? Uh, there is resistance to change to the transition because yeah, climate and energy transition means, well, there will be change and people are not always prepared to accept change and to accept that if they don't have the change now, there will be worse change later on uh, imposed on, on them by change of climate, et cetera. Um, so we see a lot and could make links to, to the populism debate that we had before, et cetera, um, that, that are trying to exploit this and um, put the social and distributional issues first. We see challenges because of the crisis that are coming. We saw challenges with respect to the COVID crisis where climate and energy and sustainability agenda were questioned. That was overcome. We saw challenges now with the Ukraine-Russia crisis that, again, the agenda is, uh, has been questioned. Again, there has been a big majority politically as well as uh, um, uh, societally to actually overcome that and say, no, it's important and actually helps and we should focus on the synergies that are uh, between these. But in the small pockets, you see kind of the backlash potential that is there. On the industry side, industry is increasingly saying, well, this is getting too much for us, either because it's true or because they want to exploit the situation. Uh, you may have heard that, and I think that's the background to that, that uh, the European Parliament's position on the current uh, fit for 55 legislative patch package, the one of the cornerstones and that the emissions trading system didn't get through the European Parliament, was it the day before yesterday or something like that? And that was in large part because of concerns of industry. We have the trade agenda, sure, sustainability chapters being introduced, but the substance of those chapters, no. Um, agriculture, big area. Anyway, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, didn't make a lot of progress in integrating climate concerns. And now with the Ukraine crisis, they're all coming and saying, well, let's do even less. Because we need to, if you, if you want to be um, a little bit pointed, uh, because we need to feed our animals uh, instead of eating less meat. So, so there, there, there are issues there. There's, there are issues about lock-in that may now occur when we invest in new infrastructure to get gas from different sources in there, which from a climate perspective obviously doesn't, doesn't uh, make sense. And there's a lot of concerns about the speed and the depth of the transition um, that 
and the speed and the depth are, are the, 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 the demand for those is only increasing, right? The longer we postpone the decisive action that needs to happen. Um, brings me to my last point, which I promised would be brief. Um, and that is, I think we also need to realize that we probably need to prepare for uh, more turbulence and more disruption in the future. And that that more disruption and more turbulence will be fed and accelerated by the climate crisis and potential tipping points in the um, uh, that, that are going to come about. Actually, I forgot in the last one also to mention biodiversity, which is not treated in the same way. And some of the tipping points are also in that area that scientists are increasingly uh, warning us there are going to be tipping points that are irreversible and life will be different afterwards. Um, and I think we um, need to be aware that we will cross these tipping points with increasing likelihood the less we are successful with, inter uh, with implementing the European Green Deal internally as well as externally. So these tipping points are there, they are coming. And kind of, I hope that we'll have a few climate crises that push us forward or sustainability crises that are not yet these tipping points that we can't go back on anymore. Um, so with that kind of warning, uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I can say that we finish with a, in a positive note, but <laughs> we maybe go back to this. Uh, no, no. Uh, I think you also already put a, a question for Manori on the table, but <laughs> then we go back to that. Um, Sondra, now, now uh, the, the second the second point that um, Manori was talking about is again you know, these um, these uh, attempts by the EU to uh, uh, promote fundamental principle uh, that inspires the internal market, also at the multilateral level. And, and of course, it is using trade and investment uh, mechanism uh, agreements in particular no, to, to do that. So could you explain us a little bit more what are the mechanisms that, that are used or could be used, whether they are effective or, or the, if the drawbacks are larger than, than the benefit we get? Uh, let me say, first of all, that I'm happy to be here to celebrate the 20 years of the School of International Study and being part of the community. And concerning the question, uh, it's well connecting to Mallory's presentation, but also to Sebastian one. Uh, he was mentioning sustainable development chapters and what's the substance of those chapters. And also Mallory uh, talking about the policy, so the future also of the EU trade and investment policy. Uh, I'm now focusing more on what's existing right now. What is the content of such treaties today and whether they are really effective in furthering EU principles, human rights, fundamental principles uh, that the EU itself uh, summarize in rule of law, human rights and democratic principles or are not effective. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, let me say that are the funding treaty of the European Union that ask the European Union to further such fundamental principles in extern with the external action as well, not just internally. And then what, what instruments? The European Union is using its trade and investment agreements as lever in this regard to spread around the world and somehow influence other countries in adopting uh, human rights in respect to in promoting human rights and democratic principles and also the environment, for instance, in respect to the environment. How that? Uh, basically, there are two types of provisions that I will illustrate very, very briefly, uh, emphasizing the criticism and, and the problems emerging in relation to those provisions. The first type of provisions are so-called essential element clauses, are provisions that they require, uh, that are included in trade agreements since the 1990s, and require the trade partners, so the European Union and its bilateral trade partner, to respect and promote human rights uh, in their trade relations and internally. Um, those provisions that require the parties to respect human rights are um, somehow implemented through um, another provision that allow the party, each, both parties of the treaty to suspend the treaty, so to adopt measures in case such provision essential element provisions are violated by the other business partner. So somehow it is 
uh, allow the business partner and the EU mostly uh, that see the other partner not complying with such human rights provisions to suspend the treaty and somehow subordinate trade on uh, human rights and fundamental principles. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, this type of provisions, the, the EU has been very cautious in applying such type of provision. There's no cases so far. Uh, even though civil society and European Parliament have asked the European Commission to be more um, robust on uh, taking measures in case uh, in relation to this type of violation of the treaty. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the European Parliament is, has been the most active player in this regard, suspending the ratification, the approval of the agreement with China, uh, I think last year in 2021, because of China, uh, so before having the treaty, because of China treatment of its minorities within uh, the country. Uh, on the other hand, hand, the European Commission is not taking action uh, in this regard. Treaties also include uh, those famous sustainable development chapters. Their content is slightly different, but in broader terms, we might say they deal with human rights as well. Um, those provisions require, usually uh, require the business partners to not to lower the standard of protection, labor rights and environment, and to make efforts to improve them. Then there are some sparse provision on social elements, social aspects, and uh, other biodiversity, for instance, and other environmental aspects. Um, those are not essential elements of the treaty, meaning that any violation to this type of provisions, including the sustainable development chapters, does not entail, does not allow the other business partner, trade partner, to uh, suspend or terminate the treaty, but just open up a process, a mechanism of consultation to persuade the other partner to voluntarily comply with the sustainable development chapter. That happened in one case. There are mixed feelings concerning this type of chapters. There has been heavy criticism stating that it's just best endeavor language or soft, uh, soft tools of enforcement. There has been in any case one case uh, of the treaty with South Korea, the European Union opened up this um, consultation monitoring process with an expert panel and at the end of the day was able to persuade uh, Korea to adopt spontaneously um, a domestic legislation that allow for the ratification of the three missing international labor organization conventions on uh, the freedom of association, especially uh, so rights of freedom of association internally. Uh, so that was a sort of achievement, but the only one that we know. Uh, having said that, effectiveness, uh, I think I've already said something on that. Uh, so far, we can't say that those provisions are effective in um, promoting the human rights, at least, or in pushing trade partners in implementing uh, human rights and other um, democratic principles and the rule of law. Uh, a study carried out in 2019 by uh, the European Commission on two specific trade agreements that were that was the EU-Mexico Global Agreement and EU-Chile Association Agreement. Uh, from this study, it emerges that the treaties and the provisions on human rights and sustainable development included in such treaties actually may play a role in creating some incentives for changes, but then uh, it's just one of the many elements that may contribute to the change in the other, in domestically, in the other in the trade partner. Um, many different instruments are, shall be used, and therefore it means that this is not the element per se, but is one of the many that the European Union can put in place to help trade partners to adopt such uh, higher standard of protection of my rights. Then the other question would be uh, some criti critics of, of this attitude of the European Union uh, in setting, in imposing somehow uh, standards of protection of my rights is that is a neoliberal way of neo-colonialism way to approach uh, developing countries. And therefore there's also the resistance from developing countries arguing that this is an interference with their domestic affairs on the one hand, and at the same time, something that might compromise competitiveness because 
higher level of labor protection means higher prices, means cost, and that may uh, impact on the capacity of companies located in developing countries to be competitive. I think I, I can stop here for this first round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sondra. Uh, I think we'll go back to a couple of things you said at the, at the end, perhaps. Um, Umberto, uh, now we uh, move a little bit on, on uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, that is a, a long classic, if you like, uh, that is the, uh, the transatlantic relations. Of course, uh, we, when we talk about um, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, we have in mind uh, emerging markets in particular, but of course now we have also to think about the, the large partner, the, the US. So to a certain extent, of course, the, the Ukraine crisis is a, a case in point. Maybe we can discuss that maybe later, mm -hmm. but uh, if you could help us, you know, like to, to trace how the history of uh, transnational um, transatlantic relations uh, relates with the uh, strategic autonomy, with the EU finding its own identity to certain extent. Well, actually, uh, many thanks, Andrea, and many thanks also for another thing that you have said in, in the introduction, because we are going to, I'm going to talk about transatlantic relations, but at the same time, Andrea, in, in introducing the, the panel, spoke about the construction of a European identity and the construction of a system of external relations, and the two levels, the three levels actually, European identity, external relations, and transatlantic relations are really uh, interconnected. Um, especially over the last 20 years, we have been talking and listening to people talking about the end of the West, the end of the liberal international order, and we have been discussing whether trade disputes, uh, the deepening of European integration, and the developing of a European Union foreign policy different stances in international fora between the United States and the European Union represented a threat for the survival of the Atlantic Community. Um, I, would, uh, I would make actually two points in uh, partially connected with these problems, uh, two points which are partially in contradiction between them and that to some extent will complicate our understanding of the transatlantic relations. The first one, current tensions, because there are tensions in European and American relations and efforts, have deep roots. Generally, we tend to consider the end of the Cold War as the moment in which something happened in transatlantic relations, but my impression, and many historians claim this point, the impression is that tensions started during the 70s, that it was during the 70s that the two shores of the Atlantic found or uh, started to find different, to follow different paths. Until the 70s, Atlanticism and European integration were on the same path. For a Western country, for a Western citizen, for, for a Western European citizen, uh, being Atlanticist and being in favor of European integration were more or less synonymous. But by the 70s, there was a split. In this transformation, here the identity becomes important. The European community was not just a passive player, a passive actor, because it contributed with its choices to the definition of a more strained alliance. And uh, it contributed also to setting the stage for current problems and tensions in transatlantic relations. Of course, these. Uh, trends, these transformations were part of broader changes. Yesterday, Anne-Marie Slaughter mentioned that by the 70s, everyone was talking about global interdependence. And this was a general global transformation. Of course, some specific American actions, unilateral actions and decisions complicated and contributed to strain the alliance. But something that generally is neglected is the fact that the European community contributed to the worsening in transatlantic relations with the attempt to define a European political identity. So I don't want to go into too many details on this, this uh, specific topic, but the inception of what was called European political cooperation, which was a sort of embryonic foreign policy for the European community. Uh, the attempt to create a real supranational democracy, 1979, the election, the first, for the first time of the European Parliament, 
but also the deepening of financial and monetary uh, integration in Europe to the snake in the tunnel and at the end of the 70s, the European monetary system, all these decisions, actions, they all contributed to craft uh, the idea that Europe, the European community, was an autonomous player in international relations, uh, that it was partially different from the United States. The European community wanted to prove that it was an international, political, and diplomatic player, not just a single market. And with the attempt to define itself, the European community contributed to develop a distinctiveness from the United States. This is the first point. Second point, despite the tensions, differences, and problems that emerged already in the 70s, my impression, and I I'm talking about impressions because the toolbox of the historian is not suitable to talk about recent events, is that the interdependence between the European Union and the United States has been growing over the last few years. Of course, we continue to have differences that emerge from time to time. The European Union and the United States have plenty of disputes. Oh, those over uh, the war in Iraq, the 2008 recession, recent tariffs and protectionist disputes and different regulations. But despite these conflicts, uh, transatlantic relations continue to flourish. And this is quite clear if we took three main areas. The first one, security. Security of first and concerns. Here the focus is on NATO actually. Uh, its evolution from a passive Cold War alliance whose major aim was at being a deterrent against any potential Soviet aggression, which then became a larger and more active defense body. Of course, within NATO, there were differences and problems between the United States and European partners, the European Union, polemics over NATO's enlargement, uh, Donald Trump's approach NATO or French President Emmanuel Macron who claimed who depicted NATO as a brain dead organization a few years ago. But these trends of criticism actually uh, led to a uh, general neglect of the fact that after all NATO was able not only was able to survive through the Cold War and through these criticisms but it also demonstrated a remarkable adaptability for a military alliance that now encompasses 30 countries and more or less 800 million citizens. In this sense, actually, uh, we go back to what Andrea said in the introduction, to the fact that the construction of a European identity uh, and a European foreign policy, at least in, in the military realm is still far from being realized. Second area, economic differences and economic interdependence. The strength of the transatlantic relationship has certainly been tested over the last few years by the rise of protectionist policies and impulses on both shores of the Atlantic. Uh, debates on tariffs and regulations, different ways to cope with the economic crisis which started in 2008 or with the COVID related economic crisis, different approaches to environmental and energy prob current problems or restrictions and different legislations of, on the digital economy, for example. All this contributed to create some friction between the United States and the European Union from an economic perspective, but even today, the, the United States and Europe remain each other's most important markets. Transatlantic networks of economic interdependence have become so dense, in fact, that they have attained uh, a quality far different from those each continent has with the rest of the world. Final point, uh, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, human rights, and challenges to these let's call it uh, shared political values. The Atlantic area is the largest uh, 
and fighting for greater democratic head in the world. And both America and European democracies are facing several common challenges. And the Murats who discussed the rise of populism in Western Europe and the, in the European Union, which is actually a transnational and common problem for both the European Union and the United States. Uh, Britain's Brexit, the election of Trump, or the explosion of nationalist and nativist movements led many analysts to predict the collapse of the transatlantic alliance. But again, my impression is that over the last two or three years, maybe in connection with the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine, uh, these, uh, this crisis was matched by a partial rejection of this transnational populism. Maybe because, as Andrew Morazzi suggested this morning, a few hours ago, uh, they bark more than they bite. Thus, similar political trends in Europe and in the United States, both for the challenges that governments are facing and the, the ways, the, the solutions that governments are crafting to cope with them. These are part of demonstration that the European Union and the United States remain highly integrated. And for the moment, I think that I can stop here. Thank you, Umberto. Well, Umberto mentioned security, and so clearly, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I will address um, the question regarding, uh, to a certain extent, I think that at the beginning I made the example about the competition policy, now defending each other from competition and now it's getting together to compete with others. I think in security policy we've seen something similar, uh, defend it from each other and now trying to uh, explore a, a sort of federalization of defense. So it, is there any value added in doing that? Is it possible? How far we are from that objective? Thank you. Richard. All right, uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, celebrate the anniversary, and uh, in this context, share a few ideas on EU's uh, security and, and, and defense. Well, it's, it's obviously difficult not to start with war in Ukraine. And uh, as we all know, we, we hear a lot of uh, cliches uh, um, and kind of big words, you know, talking about wake up calls or, or popped up defense bubbles and, and these kind of things. And it's, it's not the first time we actually hear these. Uh, we could hear it in the early 1990s during the war in the Balkans, then, you know, during 9-11 and the subsequent terrorist attacks, then during the particular period of instability in North Africa, Middle East and stuff like that. So it's like a constant, uh, 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 I would say like a constant and returning rhetoric. However, this time there really seems to be some some real changes, and so so it might be worth uh, you know looking looking at them. And I'd like to look at two particular uh, particular things, particular elements. And and the first is uh, uh, defense spending, and and it is obviously related then because money doesn't solve it you know automatically. You know it, it, it must be used. Uh, effectively so so it's related with the second point how the eu should uh, uh, should behave or maybe rather uh, given my reasoning about the, the problem how the eu shouldn't kind of uh, kind of behave so so coming back to the uh, the defense uh, spending um, uh, as we all know the european states uh, took uh, a peace uh, dividend in, 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 in 1990s, you know, connected with the alleged end of history and all these uh, kind of things. And, uh, and the trend, you know, hasn't changed much. And military analysts really like figures and data, and I'm not going to bore you much with these, but I'd like to raise uh, just a few figures. If you look at the defense uh, spending, defense expenditures in the last 20 years, the EU uh, expenditures uh, increased by 20% absolute figures not relative which is a huge difference u.s uh, defense expenditures by roughly 66 percent there might be different metrics but uh, i think it's more about the the context russian by 300 percent and chinese by 600 uh, percent so so this is this is the the most recent if, and in security and defense 20 years is actually quite a, a short period so so this is the most uh, recent evolution so it's definitely time to act and and, and we see that uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, EU member states, you know, seem to act. You know, they, they promise to invest 200 billion, additional 200 billion euros uh, uh, into, into defense, which is actually really a lot if you look at the kind of standard uh, uh, standard figures. And there are some EU initiatives uh, as well, particularly the European Defense Fund with 9, millions, 9 billion sorry, euros uh, for the for the upcoming budgetary uh, budgetary period. So this is a new situation and, and some sort of real opportunity to change, you know, the, the situation with the EU uh, uh, sort of defense, security and defense performance, if, if I may put it, uh, put it this way. And I think it's extremely important not to hamper, you know, this, uh, uh, this, this opportunity by some unrealistic uh, uh, visions and, and wrong political decisions or even and, and something what I would call like an intra-hegemonic uh, intra -hegemonic attempts. And, uh, and that brings me to the second point, obviously, which is the, which is the EU, EU response. And uh, what we currently hear, and it actually started before the war because you know, the situation was deteriorating, uh, we, we see a new wave of uh, not just discourse, it's actually some sort of real initiative talking about federalization of defense or centralization of defense, uh, defense policies. And I definitely think this is not a good uh, a way forward. And I'd like to spend a few remaining minutes to actually explain, uh, explain why, I, why I think so. And I could start with a symbolic note. Uh, you may have noticed there is a new strategic vision of the EU security and defense, a strategic compass. And the, the document was drafted before the Russian invasion um, and approved after like two months ago. And uh, this little thing as all out war actually hasn't changed it, you know, hasn't changed the wording. So it's still the same. And I could make a, a cheap fun of it further, you know, with 5,000 troops uh, that are assigned as a sort of response force and, and 200 experts, just again to contextualize Russia invaded Ukraine uh, with, uh, uh, with, with a four times higher uh, number of troops uh, than is the NATO response force, and it's 40K. So, so these are the real numbers if we talk about, uh, if we talk about uh, the current situation. And, uh, and let me bring up one kind of very simple uh, uh, thought experiment. Just imagine how many foreign affairs council that would take to convince, say, Hungary, to take a military action, any kind of providing weapons, you know, supporting, uh, supporting Ukraine. So I'm all for uh, negotiations, uh, 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 deliberation, trade-offs. Uh, uh, it's perhaps the only way how to keep things together politically. But uh, in, in defense area, this might come at huge uh, costs and, and I think the EU cannot really afford it. And I could support this argument by a couple of historical examples. And I don't want to teach about, talk about Treaty of Paris because it's, yeah. it's an ancient history you know, in, in this perspective. But how many of you remember procurement directives uh, from 2008, 2009 and the European defense equipment market, you know, the, the, big, uh, the big term and the idea that uh, liberalization will actually solve defense as it may have solved, you know, other, uh, other industrial, you know, areas, uh, areas, uh, uh, areas in Europe. And there was just one simple paragraph, you know, saying that uh, if there are national interests, uh, you know, at play, you know, this entire framework could be avoided. And that was just enough, you know, to, to pre I'm kind of simplifying things a bit, but this was just enough to, to kind of hamper uh, the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire initiative. Um, there are also several type of European buzzwords, you know, typically European buzzwords that, that sounds extremely rational, like pooling, sharing, uh, deduplication, initiatives or processes and stuff like that. But if you look at the former context and they were used, they were actually used to, to, to reduce spending, you know, as, as a cost effective, uh, uh, as a cost effective uh, mechanisms. And they seem to be very problematic when it comes to, uh, when it comes to military uh, practice, because militaries are not necessarily puzzles that you just put together a few pieces and you create a force. It's just simply, uh, it just simply doesn't work like that. And in uh, and, and the European context, these words are often used with uh, some sort of large project that might often have uh, uh, like a special political motivations behind them. And that means that this might not be the 
to the most effective way uh, kind of forward. And just again, to give you some example, Germany recently decided to procure, I think 30 F-35s, which is a great decision and definitely good thing for European security and defense and, and obviously very rational decision. You know, many military experts would say that uh, the jets with the stealth technology and, and with the systems that are able to acquire and destroy targets on long, long range are actually still the best. But there was a huge reaction, you know, from the, from the French side, you know, claiming that this is not exactly the way how European sovereignty, defense sovereignty and, and European defense autonomy should be built. And, and I actually think this is the way how European sovereignty and, 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 and some defense, you know, should be built. And it's not a surprise that the UK decided to, uh, it already has a couple of, uh, decided to, to purchase, uh, you know, uh, further uh, 35s and I think the Netherlands, Switzerland even, or Finland. So, so, and that brings me to perhaps one of my uh, kind of final, uh, final points that national governments actually do act when it comes to uh, security and, and defense. So if the, if, the, if the threat perceptions are actually really high, which now they obviously are, then they do act. We know it from Cold War history. Uh, we know it uh, not that much, you know, from the past 30 years, as I, as, I, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, but with this 20 billion euros, which is still a promise, but, but I think large part of it will materialize. But that's a huge money. Just compare it with the 9 billion European defense fund. Uh, if you take the budgetary period, it's just 1 billion per year. So, I mean, it's great. And, and uh, we can talk later about where this money should be invested, for example, the European one. But, uh, but if you compare it with the national spendings, you know, this, uh, that's, uh, uh, that, 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 that's almost uncomparable. And, 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 and again, you know, the, the, the national governments, you know, really, you know, seem to, uh, seem to act here. And, and just a final and very final note, you know, NATO in, in its long history has never come up with this idea to kind of centralize things. There are processes, uh, very effective ones, like coalitions of willing, which is perfect, you know, for, for, for joint procurement or purchasing stuff. And, uh, but they are still, you know, G2G based and the centralization, I am afraid, uh, will not bring any effectiveness to uh, to uh, this particular sector in Europe. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Ritek. So we uh, agreed to have a second round, the shorter, and then to open up, of course, to this. We have time till uh, 12.30, if I'm correct. Uh, also to allow the speakers to exchange among each other, and of course, a question from, from the audience. Uh, so uh, my question will be brief. Um, I, perhaps I will start with uh, um, Sebastian because uh, you you ended your uh, your speech by saying uh, by mentioning what happened in the European Parliament recently. So let, let me ask this uh, naive question. So on the one hand, we have a transnational movement that is supporting environment protection, and now we see that there's a sort of transnational, at least the European level, uh, industrial. Um, uh, second thoughts, you know, uh, maybe we, we are running too much, maybe we are not ready to do that, maybe we can do that alone. So uh, are we seeing, uh, finally, European movements uh, on the, on the um, uh, environmental issues? Uh, so finally, we're talking, uh, you know, we have parties and social movements with a transnational dimension in the EU on the most uh, important issue on the table, which is climate change and the industrial um, transformation associated with that. Right. Um, good question. <laughs> Just thinking what the answer is. Um, so when when I look at this and when what happens, obviously we we have had, and I don't know whether it's just a European movement or an international movement. Um, social movements in that area that have obviously then transnational and the first that comes to mind is, is the Fridays for Future, right? And and that is, uh, has had also for analysts like, like me an, an amazing effect because the science has been out there, the knowledge has been out there. And the moment that social movement really got on underway, how we could suddenly uh, move politically was still astonishing for me, at least to see like like you know 
questioning the rationality of policymaking, I guess, guess or, or the, the, the kind of rationality that, that is out there. Because as I said, the, the facts were known before. Um, whether that now is cutting the whole political landscape in a different way, I'm not so sure. So what you see happening with the current uh, Fit for 55 package um, of, of uh, legislation that implements the 55 emission reduction, 55% uh, emission reduction commitment that is in the European climate law. Uh, so a set of 15 legislative proposals, let's not elaborate it, it's uh, complicated enough. Um, so if you if you look at the conflict lines, etc., it's sometimes along party lines. Uh, so then the socialists and the uh, EPP in the parliament, etc., and sometimes more along national lines. And that's perhaps an interesting mixture. That then it's not that much party lines anymore, but it's. Uh, okay, the French will be in favor of uh, nuclear power, right? So that, that will determine their uh, voting behavior a little bit. And then, then um, so whether that is completely new, I, I wouldn't necessarily think so, um, but it's, it's getting a little bit more messy perhaps, also in what happened now in the European Parliament Then the EPP made a coalition actually with ECR and ID, so with the right wings more to try to change the things which had backlash on the left that then said, okay, then we block the whole thing if you are doing, uh, playing these games. But these are obviously kind of daily developments, whether that will become more structural. Um, it is, I think, an open question and there's a good chance that things will fall into place and that, that eventually it will be the kind of big majority to the left of the right wing <laughs> that, that, that will carry things forward. Um, so I wouldn't, would also not actually um, say that, that that was a big crisis now that that was, uh, that was rejected. We'll see in a couple of weeks whether it is or not, perhaps it will all be mended. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know whether that's a perfect response to your question, but that's um, perhaps a, a little bit. And I'm happy to go into the details of the fit for 55 if anyone wants. <laughs> okay, so we keep this uh, for, for the questions. And I also you mentioned about the, um, the agricultural policy at the beginning, no? and also there we got you know, different positions. So the cleavages that you mentioned are very interesting to explore. Maybe we can go back on that later. I would like to ask the same question to Sondra and to Mallory, uh, which is, um, Okay, it's twofold. So maybe Mallory will also wants to reply to uh, the criticism to a certain extent that Sebastian raised earlier on on the ineffectiveness or um, about the, the treaties. But the question is also about the, I mean, the, the, the European Union aspires to be a, a, a rule setter, uh, a standard setter. Uh, but if you want to do that, you also have to exploit, as Sondra said, the leverage of the EU market. And you have to be integrated. No? If you don't get integrated, you can uh, export your, your values, your the rules. Um, so I would like you to, to, to address this point. So to, the, the tension that there is on the one hand to have agreements that are bilateral, regional, that um, create niches, mm, um, and the aspiration to a global sector, uh, to what extent they can go together um, if Mallory wants to start first and then maybe Sonda. I think I will start with due diligence in this respect uh, and saying, so, so the proposal dates from uh, February of this year by the commission. It should have been released end of last year. So we understood that there was some tension that has been eventually released. And so the tension comes most probably from the business sector, but it is there. And it is there for one reason, different reasons. First, it's a mandatory system. And this mandatory system is far more effective and efficient compared to a voluntary system. And this we know because those rules exist uh, exists already, the UN guiding principle on human rights, on business and human rights is soft law. We have statistics there that the companies are not necessarily following them, but they are following more mandatory schemes and this, they already exist even at EU level with the timber regulation. 
So we are in an agenda that already exists since 10 years. So it's not completely new that there are tensions here because we are evolving and we are going through this due diligence, uh, due diligence directive cross-sectoral. But if we have it as well, it's because we need a level playing field, not only globally, but at the EU level, because the member states are acting there already, France, cross-sectoral mandatory, uh, the Netherlands, sectoral, uh, sectoral mandatory, Germany also recently, cross-sectoral mandatory. So it's first for the business that we are doing it for you to have a level playing field and at the EU level and then broader at the global level. And this goes together with legal certainty. And that's why um, when we say there are tensions, yes, because we broaden, but again, everything is done step by step. And on the basic principle, I'm a lawyer of proportionality. Not yet all companies are covered, but the main companies, the big companies. And if the companies are targeted are smaller and are targeted is in specific sectors. Uh, so it's really a proportion of the approach and a step by step approach. There are tensions, but the industry knows that it has to follow. Because if you look at the series, what is what do we uh, what do we wish reshoring is this going to bring resilience no what is going to bring resilience is continuing going globally but for this we need common values and where are the common values first and foremost in sustainability is the other branch which is fair fair trade and unfairness that's far more under tension on sustainability, that's the way to go if we wish to continue to benefit from international trade. And the common values, and there I'm referring to Pascal Lamy, the common values, we have sustainability, we'll broaden it to other values. When are we going to get out of this period of crisis? Perhaps in two decades. Why, and this is the theory put forward by Pascal Lamy, which is to say once the, global, the majority of the global population will be in the middle class, will start to get out of this type of crisis between geopolitical uh, blocks or geopolitical, uh, the geopolitical tensions. And so we are in a period that is uh, that has started uh, around five, 10 years ago and will continue most probably in my opinion, uh, 10 to 20 years. But we need to continue uh, putting forward global governance and globalization. And it will be difficult, uh, but there are solutions. Uh, there are solutions, but step by step. So I, I think that I will uh, close here, but I have other remarks if need be. Thank you. I think you would like to reply. Um, that's true. You said that most probably the resistance came from the business sector, not most probably came from the business sector. They realized the reform, they were very upset concerning the reforms because, because they put it, uh, the burden upon the shoulders, especially a small medium company, which is the reality of the European Union. And indeed, if you look at, if you look to the draft directive coming from the European Parliament and the draft directive now coming from the Commission is much more different and the scope of application is reduced in the Commission after the statements by businesses across all Europe. So what I'm asking here is does due diligence corporate sustainability due diligence directive is needed as a step that European Union needs and perhaps the world, the world, world needs but does it, it takes into consideration the reality, the business reality of the European Union? And the first thing I, would, I wouldn't say they, it did. Now, perhaps the, the design of the directive is better uh, suited to the reality that takes into account uh, thousands of small, medium companies. 
Yesterday, they gave us some percentages of companies in our region and in the region close by, which is Veneto going global, are small, uh, around 20% for Trentino, 40% about Veneto, I think they're on, in between for Emilia Romagna, which are the main exporters in Italy. They are not big companies exporting, they're small, medium companies. How can we support them in implementing this type of regulation towards sustainability? The European Union that I'm connecting to the global standard, standard setter uh, is very much good in setting global standards, not much through trade agreements that involve other countries, but much more through domestic legislation that impact with extraterritorial reach, that impact on businesses around the world. Even outside the European Union, so far these European companies have some relationship with companies within the European Union. The due diligence uh, directive we are mentioning um, apply also to companies that are incorporated and operating abroad, but part of the value chain of a EU company. This means that a EU company has the obligation to assure that the partner located somewhere else comply with the same high standards. That puts the EU company, perhaps other countries will adopt the same high threshold very fast, but uh, at this point, we are putting European companies, especially small and medium companies, because I don't see so much big companies except multinational from the United States in Europe, or very few big companies truly European. We put the business sector in very hard times. Then we can say that the change we want, we want to more sustainability if small and medium companies are not able to approach sustainability, that's fine, they can't fail. But perhaps there might be other solution supporting the type of business we have, which is not just an Italian typical sector, but also other European countries as this type of businesses and support them towards the change. So I'm wondering whether the European Union can also finance and help concretely those business, which is basically what those business were saying in this report. And I think it's okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So again, uh, if I may uh, use the um, global level, the rule set at the global level issue, uh, this calls, um, it allows to enlarge a little bit the discussion to the technology in general. No? And so I, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, perhaps you could help us to understand the, the big role that technology has, of course, um, in, in normal trade, in normal uh, industrial activities, but clearly even more in uh, in defense and in security related issues, technology is at the core of that. Um, could you help us explore the international dimension of this field? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the uh, question. So my, my, my first intervention was uh, maybe a bit skeptical, you know, in, in terms of uh, what we may expect uh, from the EU in the area of, uh, of defense, but it certainly doesn't mean that uh, I, I would be generally skeptical about the EU as, as becoming like a real actor in uh, even in the security and, 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 and defense area. It was just really about the centralization efforts. But coming to your question and perhaps, you know, link it with my, with my previous uh, introduction, I, I really do think that the EU has a uh, has couple of strengths that uh, obviously should be utilized also in, in, in this particular area and um, one of the main ones is in stimulating you know research and, and innovation through even through various you know joint initiatives and that's hopefully at least i hope is, is something where the european defense fund you know seems to be uh, seems, seems to be uh, so, sort of moving so uh, so so i i think there might be specific areas uh, where we could find quite easily uh, like a joint sort of political uh, or political consensus uh, on on, on th that could be sort of stimulated by the by the uh, EU research and innovation structures and 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 here I would be uh, mostly talking about uh, some kind of areas that I would call like a softer in, in terms of security uh, security and defense and uh, and or even we could perhaps specify it a bit more uh, by uh, by digital uh, by digital technologies because these things are obviously 
extremely important in the current security landscape. And I'm not only talking about uh, cyber warfare, but I'm perhaps even more talking about uh, about systems that would be based on uh, on uh, on artificial intelligence or with machine learning uh, machine learning uh, based technologies. And not only in the narrow area of defense, but uh, in the overall area of, of uh, um, you know society's security security and safety and i think here you know that the, the role may be uh, may be really immense and again uh, uh, to <laughs> to come up with some warning which uh, uh, which uh, uh, seems to be a case you know in, in my interventions this uh, th this morning um, i think one area and it's one particular area i'm interested in uh, is uh, to kind of make sure that the planned regulations in the digital technologies or here more specifically connected with with artificial intelligence will uh, will not you know hamper the initiative the, or the innovative uh, kind of dynamics and 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 will improve you know the yes the security the society the youth society security uh, security and safety and i think there is a there is a huge process of how to regulate or standardize artificial intelligence for example there are some initiatives that seem to be like highly problematic from the innovative perspective from the uh, from the industrial perspective and uh, and even from the i would say academic perspective they does not seem to be uh, uh, does not seem to make sense it does not seem to be kind of working and this is one particular area where you know the, there should be a lot of focus, you know, put on how to how to solve these uh, uh, these uh, these kind of things. So so these softer technologies and research and innovations, I think it's a, it's a great place for for EU initiatives and, and the budgets that are allocated, you know, are, are kind of realistic in, in improving, you know, this this area. And it's obvious this something where EU can play a, a complementary role to, to to NATO and and this kind of hard. Uh, hard defense areas. So this would be my answer perhaps for now. Thank you. Thank you, Vita. Um, and again, uh, I would like to uh, borrow from in a, something that um, Umberto anticipated earlier on, that is that he would have, if we promise actually, to uh, discuss a little bit more about this specific situation, again, transatlantic relations um, related um, in the Ukraine. Uh, so whether the EU and the US are somehow aligned. You can take it, of course, uh, from a histor historical perspective and not necessarily sure. only focusing on, the, on nowadays. And later on, I, I think we can open up to the questions and the, the speakers have already put forward some issues that they would like to discuss. So I, I, I wrote them down, <laughs> so I hope that you also. So I'll try to keep it as short as possible. And actually, we'll rely on what we said on the relationship between research and development at the European level and NATO, because First of all, an event like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, has an impact, a huge impact on the European Union and transatlantic relations. Uh, in the first round, I have identified two areas which touch trans transatlantic relations, economic relations, security, democracy. And in all these three perspectives, there's a clear uh, impact of the Ukrainian war, which seems to, to, to have strengthened the Atlantic bond and the sense of the Atlantic community. It is something that actually, before the war, I wouldn't be talking about the Atlantic community. Uh, the Atlantic, I would have said that the Atlantic community is something that belongs to the past. But the war re-established re re a strong uh, link between the United States and Western Europe, the European Union, and transatlantic actions. Actually, at the beginning, before the war and at the beginning of the war, couldn't be taken for granted when the war started. The transatlantic community is um, sending weapons to Ukraine. It's imposing extraordinary ranges of sanctions against Russia. It gave a new sense of purpose to NATO. Uh, it strengthened, especially on the American side, the, the a positive attitude towards democracy in the world and towards the European project. 
uh, it is something that probably Biden was mentioning even before the war started that uh, the United States wanted to push a new Atlanticism based on shared values and interests. But focusing on the European side, actually, and here actually I'm going to rely on what Pete said. On the one side, my, my impression is that the war started or strengthened the double process for the European Union. On the one side, it has strengthened the American leadership in security affairs within NATO. The fact that the European Union should rely, is relying on the United States for its security and that the European Union cannot prescind from the American role in granting security, in assuring security. On the other one, actually, if we open the Pandora's box of discussions about European sovereignty, European identity, European military capability, the need to have an autonomous military pool. Of course, I'm, I'm unable to predict which directions we will take at the end uh, of this debate. But one thing that it is quite new and one thing that I'm quite, which is quite clear to me is that the Ukrainian crisis accelerated a renewed cooperative attitude between the United States and the European Union. Thank you, Umberto. Um, so I think that we, we can open up the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much. We, yeah, there is the microphone there. Okay, we will use that one. So uh, we can go one by one, perhaps. So that we uh, any question, Luisa? Thank you. And Luisa again. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody on the panel. And I'm unsurprisingly going to ask something about the environment, but um, you know, we all like being predictable occasionally, right? Um, so um, we've talked a bit um, about sustainability, etc. And I'd like to ask, um, I'm actually drawing on something that uh, Professor Obertor wrote uh, uh, with a, a group of people uh, a couple of years ago, I think now, which was a call for transformative governance. Um, and basically pointing out that in light of things like tipping points, some of which we've already reached, some of which we are very, very uh, dangerously close to reaching, um, and this kind of urgency and crisis that we need to flip the underlying logics that uh, guide the way that we try and hit sustainability, right? Um, perhaps rebalancing towards the original idea of sustainable development, which was a much more balanced approach that wasn't, um, we can have economic growth as long as it's not damaging to the environment and social fabric, but rather that all of these things, three things are, are equal goals, right? So um, I, I was interested hearing this uh, 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 very good question that, that Mallory also uh, pointed out, you know, can you hit sustainability goals, environmental goals using a trade agreement? Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking the panel, my thoughts are a little bit disorganized, I apologize. Can we transform governance? Can we transform Europe as a global actor if we are still essentially trying to do it through trade agreements, trying to do it through uh, uh, acting on the multilateral stage as an organization with economic roots, right? Is it, is, is it ideationally possible for us to really transform the way that we approach multiple crises, uh, given the history of the European Union and the way it has integrated? And especially given um, not only the fact that um, we have uh, some perceptions from partners, particularly developing country partners, that we don't have the moral authority to do that because of colonial history, because we have a very long history of Europe enriching itself basically from the resources of countries that we now want to be more equal trading partners with. Um, do we also have uh, uh, an issue there in terms of the contestation that we come from inside Europe, right? So we're very clearly still in a moment of uh, uh, 
not the uh, consensus, but the dissensus moment. So exactly movements pushing for more participatory governance, movements pushing for different kinds of approaches. And none of those claims are very uh, uh, consonant with acting in a unified and fast and urgent way uh, at the international level, right? So how do we, can we really transform on the model that we've already got, I guess? Thank you. Uh, I think I changed my mind. So uh, given that the question is uh, touching very many points of many, many people, uh, I would collect the other two questions as well so that you can also manage to cover uh, all the, and Ginevra as well. Uh, see, uh, Luisa, Jens, Ginevra, and then uh, we address the question, okay? Sorry, uh, sorry, Luigi as well, okay. Uh, <laughs> you will have to be very fast. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my, my question is for Vit and the issue of uh, security and defense. Now, we heard many times that essentially European states are spending quite a lot on defense. If you combine all the expenditures, national expenditures, uh, so that we are a big player, but then when it comes into the national fraction, you see that those, all those expenditures are inefficient and not working. Now, it seems that your point was essentially going the other way around. That is that um, we see no centralization and actually this is how we should go on. So to me, this is a little bit puzzling. I see why it's not going on. There's no centralization, essentially because we don't have any foreign policy. And if you don't have a foreign policy, why should we be able to develop a defense policy? Um, but whether this is something that we should keep as a model to me, <laughs> Is, is less clear. Uh, and the other thing that I would like to ask to you is how you assess PESCO, because to me, it was somehow a surprise that it developed quite quickly and um, with many, many states on board. But at the same time, the results are not cl clearly visible, maybe to somebody like me, who's not an expert. Thank you. Thank you. I have also an assessment question <laughs> in the sense that Andrea started uh, this round table, which is on the future of Europe as a global actor, uh, with the remark that the EU uh, could find its identity through its external policy, you know, and uh, what you usually you rephrase this uh, with regard to enlargement, that enlargement is actually a way of defining identity and uh, the transformative power of the EU. So my, my question would be, how do you assess also from your different point of views that enlargement actually is, sorry, a mess and that there is, uh, in, in particular in Southeastern Europe, there is no movement and no success at all. And now the mess is even made worse by the offer to Ukraine or the request by Ukraine, now Georgia and other countries, Moldova too. So we, we do not have any strategy, at least I don't see a strategy because we do not know what we want. And so are we uh, in these conditions where conditionality, which you were talking about in the external sphere, does not work with regard to those who are expected to implement it because they want to get in. Uh, what, what impact does this have on, on your fields and regarding the EU's position as a global actor? Thanks. Thank you, yes. Uh, Ginevra and Luigi, uh, it doesn't matter in, the, in what order. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting roundtable. I was going to circle back to um, issues about environment, and I wanted to ask the panel simply, so drawing on the national interest cost that was previously mentioned, and considering the energy supply issues that we're seeing now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, are we seeing a securitiz securitization of environmental and green policies issues? And if yes, is this a chance for the EU to jump forward in this sense, or is it more of a drawback to uh, the move towards a more green Europe? So, very much. Yes. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, so, my, my points are for uh, Sandra, Sebastian, uh, and then I have a, uh, and, uh, also for Umberto a comment. Uh, so, uh, at least in my opinion, I, I think that what's going on right now uh, is a sign that 
it's time to recognize that the influence that uh, Europe or uh, you say more in general, the West can have on uh, world affairs, it, it will be declining in next year. So we, we have seen also for with regard to the sanctions, uh, at least in terms of world population, uh, big emerging countries like China, India, Brazil uh, are not following the, the West. So uh, this has many implications also in terms of uh, European trade policy, environmental policy. Uh, so perhaps we, we should abandon a sort of top of the class syndrome to give lessons to the rest of the world. Uh, and in particular, with respect to the environment, don't forget that uh, as a world, the uh, EU, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, uh, in terms of uh, global uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions, uh, our share is 8% of global emissions. So we should take into account to have two ambitious target as we are uh, perhaps also this has to be revised because the other the rest of the world is not following us uh, china and india are planning the building of uh, uh, more um, coal and um, fuel uh, plants for instance just for giving you uh, an example and so to disrupt entire uh, industries uh, for uh, uh, reaching our targets, which are unrealistically uh, inambitious, I, I don't think it's in the interest, in the long term interest of European citizens in, in this world in which we live. Of, of, of course, we can try to condition uh, trade policies. For instance, there is a, uh, the carbon, or what's the word? Um, carbon border. Carbon border doesn't right. matter. For instance, that, that's right. But uh, again, with the uh, share of uh, Europe on world trade that will be uh, declining in the next years oh. I, I don't think that will be enough in in one word uh, to think that soft power it's enough for having a, a big influence on world affairs i think is an illusion and the ukrainian war has demonstrated this so uh, yeah. let me now go to defense because uh, this is, uh, I, I agree and uh, I share your skepticism. So over this, perhaps we have, we have to distinguish uh, industrial policy and we, we can, I think, do um, something on this with purely defense policy. On this, I'm very skeptical. Uh, I think perhaps we'll, we'll see some symbolic outcome in, uh, such as let's say rapid deployment brigade but no more than 5,000 uh, soldiers which is more symbolic than and this for many reasons now it's not my <laughs> uh, we, we can discuss for why i'm think of this uh, a final point for umberto uh, so you Identifying the 70s, the turning point uh, since we, we have seen a, a sort of split, at least between uh, US and Europe on many issues. So why the 70s? I, I'd say the 70s were also the years of the deployment of the so-called Euro missiles in which uh, Europe and the, uh, so it's more much more natural to to see the fall of the Berlin Wall, namely the end of the Cold War when the Soviet threat was over as a turning point 
and you're right that the Ukrainian war has relaunched uh, for obvious reasons the Atlantic, uh, uh, I mean, solidarity. Why? Because again, we have a, a threat at the border of Europe, very simple reason. Okay, I think that's okay. more than enough. So, sorry, okay, there are other two questions, but we have, we, we took 10 minutes for the question, five minutes for the answer. So I think we, we have to go to the answer first. And if the director that uh, can read my mind, uh, is there something about how can, can we take five minutes longer? Okay, uh, there are two questions of Michela and Vanessa, right? Uh, so I, I would like you uh, to help me out now. Uh, so for those of you who have been asked a direct question, and I think uh, that you, you well, each one of you receive at least one, uh, go straight to those. And of course, if there are general issues regarding neocolonialism and putting the uh, the Forces, as I said in Italian, the Carnage boy. So change the economics and, and environment, which has the, the we should be at the at the at the um, uh, core. Uh, and uh, maybe if you have something to say about that, okay. I guess Mallory, Sondra, and Sebastian in particular. Um, should we start in the order of the questions? So uh, from Lisa and also Sebastian, you were directly addressed at the beginning. So now we are supposed to be really brief, right? Right. So, <laughs> three points. Um, enlargement, a mess. I'm wondering, and the, the jury is still a little bit out on what the impact will be of the current geopolitical situation on, on the environmental politics. But one of the scenarios is that that will actually improve the situation because Poland and some of the Eastern more skeptical countries may come along and see kind of the light that actually, for example, rolling out renewable energy on a faster and, and larger scale um, will, will actually be in their geopolitical interest also. So still a little bit, what we'll, we'll need to see. Second point, EU is declining, the others are not coming along, let's forget about it. Um, a majority of countries have climate neutrality targets, so I think this is actually about technological and economic competition um, and actually pushing forward on that front because it's in your interest and it's in your interest to as much as possible push the others and pull them, etc., on on that front. Uh, because otherwise, and be prepared for that anyway, let me come back to that, there will be discontinuities and non-linearity in effects that we'll all feel and be prepared for lots of black swans uh, that are coming from the climate and, uh, and, and environment field. And just to say, ah, you know, we'll just mingle further. I don't think that will be. Third one, I think the only chance that we have is to exploit synergies politically also. Play with the synergies that we have with the geopolitical agenda with actually seeing this as an investment and precaution so that we don't, we'll, we'll probably need to spend all of this on defense, but not deploy it ever, you know, uh, because that's the big danger that with this discussion comes. So synergies in the political agenda. Thank you very much. Um, also, uh, do you want, Mallory and Sula, do you want to add something to this topic? Yes. With, with my. Yes. <laughs> I don't like to hear much. <laughs> uh, so, sustainability and trade. It's right. Trade, it's the second best solution. Everything should happen domestically with domestic policies, but it's not the way it works, and we need the coordination. So, the international level is necessary. There are studies showing that there may be co correlation, but positive or negative correlations between sustainability provisions in a free trade agreement and their effects on sustainability and on trade. And even one study by the World Bank of last year showing that there is causation. So really that if you put provisions in a free trade agreement, they will have an effect on the limitation of deforestation and even have positive effects on, uh, on trade. So meaning it's second best, but it has its effects. Now at the EU level, there is all, and uh, Sandra most probably knows it uh, 
as well, and it's going to uh, to confirm, is uh, is that uh, there is an either on substance or enforcement, there is a review in terms of reinforcement. So in terms of substance, there should be more priorities in terms of issue area that has to be targeted. The link should be a direct link between trade and sustainability. There should be also uh, taken into account the trade openness and the trade intensity between the EU and the trading partner. This is so the provisions need to become more specific to be more enforceable. And in terms of enforcement, we have the chief enforcement, uh, the chief trade enforcement officer uh, now since uh, since quasi two years, I think already, uh, for monitoring the implementation of those agreements. Now, with respect to developing countries, uh, the, the solution that, the, that is put forward in general is capacity building. Now, there has been a resistance in terms of financing and helping those uh, developing countries, but there seems to be some positive, uh, some positive evolution in this respect. That's the solution still now that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that is put forward in this respect. Now, for instance, with the Environmental Goods Agreement negotiations suspended in 2016, the developing countries were not part of it because of issues of disease protectionism, etc. Uh, but the possibility, there are solutions there as well to target more the environmental preferential uh, products that are uh, in which the developing countries have a comparative advantage and on which the, the tariffs could be uh, decreased to uh, to zero to get the, the developing countries in those negotiations. The, there are always possibilities to, uh, to make the agenda, uh, to put the agenda uh, forward. Now, with respect to war and sustainability, they are referring to all the cooperation initiatives since the war started by the EU, with India, with China, with the US, the Trade and Technology uh, Council, for instance, in this respect. All those initiatives have a sustainability uh, pillar. So uh, it's really just reinforcing, uh, reinforcing uh, this uh, the sustainability agenda, uh, but in in a direction of bilateral cooperation first. Thank you very much. I don't know whether also that addresses the securitization of the green agenda. Uh, Vitek, I think you received two direct uh, questions from Lisa and one from Luigi. Uh, would you like to? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So, so sorry, 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 Vitek. I, I'm sorry. I, I said that also Sondra would have joined on, on the on the same uh, sustainability related issues. No, no, I'm sorry. It's my fault. It's my fault. I will go back to to you in a second. I'm sorry. No, otherwise we we have to start again with the discussion okay, on the same okay. topic. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Vitek. My fault. Brief. Um, I'm replying to Luigi, with, which was the direct question. Um, I'm not saying that sustainability and more. Um, attention to the environment and tackle climate change is not a priority, it is. I'm just wondering and connecting to Luigi whether we are moving the right way because we have also to think about what we are lefting behind in doing that. The idea right now is, and I'm referring more on the standards of corporate due diligence, but also I might say GDPR, for instance, the, the privacy, the, the regulation that privacy, which the European Union has is promoting as a, an instrument that actually imposed a global standard for data protection. Um, I, other countries are not following or have very hard time following companies located in other countries. And that puts right now in an uncompetitiveness situation are not competitive of our companies which are suffering from that. So if you want the companies to take part to the sustainability process, um, then you have to help them out to support them in doing that because sustainability is not something that can be achieved by one country nor by one player within the country it's something that we have to work together and i don't think and i don't think the european union is taking into account that except in principle just in principle not in practice so that's what I want to say. And yes, I agree with, with Luigi's that's connected with the question that the influence of Europe is somehow declining and the case that other countries are not following also in, in the trade area is, is an example. But the European Union, the European Union actually has also influenced, is influencing, for instance, the investment agenda within the European, the United Nations uh, Group 3 that is reforming the dispute settlement mechanism. So 
I don't know. I have mixed feelings concerning that. Um, and I'm concluding. Thank you, Sundar, and my apologies. And Deepak, now the, the, the same three questions are going to appear in your face. Sorry. Oh, all right. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so, so the, the first question was about the, well, the, the national armies and centralization. So, uh, national armies, most of the European national armies are in a more or less bad shape because of two reasons. They were, they were highly underinvested and the second reason is that uh, you know the internal systems, procurement systems, but also sort of strategic planning system, you know, didn't didn't work well in in many of the countries, you know, including, for example, of, of of the Czech one. So so these are the two reasons, and and I think there are there are no other. And now we are in a situation where we might see some additional budgets, uh, you know, for for improving the armies. And and my point only was that. Uh, I really don't think that we need some sort of special centralized structure to eff to effectively work with the money, or rather that if we create it, then uh, you know we we rather decrease the effectiveness rather than increase it. And uh, um, and apart from you know a couple of uh, points that I made and a couple of historic uh, uh, historic uh, uh, moments, uh, I, I generally think that. Uh, it is extremely naive to think in terms of European army or something like that. But if you read the documents and if you, if you, if you uh, kind of read a bit between the lines of the documents, you really see that there is this ambition, and and I think it's a uh, very naive, unrealistic, and at some point also dangerous. Again, particularly if uh, if we uh, kind of accept the the idea that uh, that. Uh, uh, the European army, you know, could be like an hegemonical, like an intra-European hegemonical project of, of, of either one particular European power, or, or maybe, or maybe, or maybe a few. So, 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 so this is uh, this is more about really effectiveness, and I, and I really don't see, you know, the the points in in creating these kind of centralized institutions, uh, and because they simply don't work. And and Pesco. Uh, it's just a very minor thing, you know. It's 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 a it's a uh, obvious. It's based on mechanisms that were introduced in Lisbon Treaty. So the very idea that you could actually avoid some legal and political obstacles to actually uh, come up with with some kind of a, uh, with some kind of a cooperation. And as as far as I know, there are a couple of dozens of projects, around sixty. Um, some of them might be relevant and interesting, particularly in areas that really require international cooperation. So I think that the, the biggest ones are connected with these space technologies and then space industries. There, there are others that are connected with uh, with some naval uh, technologies, for example. So so here, you know, the cooperation is is uh, is straightforward, but it's extremely uh, kind of small, and there is basically no impact when it comes to the overall picture of. Uh, European security and defense. It, it follows the line of, you know, other, not necessarily similar initiatives, but for example, European Defense Agency. I, 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 I don't get me wrong, but when it started some 20 years ago, uh, almost, uh, I think the budget was 9 million euros and the, the budget now is 30 million euros. So it's great. I actually like some production of European Defense Agency. For example, the studies of uh, of European defense sector, industrial sector, you know, they, they were great in, in stimulating that. So maybe due to their initiatives, we actually know what we have and what we are kind of missing in Europe. So so, so it's kind of great, but these are not game changers. These are really, uh, really minor thing. And, and PESCO would be, uh, would be a similar case. So yes, there is no other way, I think, to, to improve uh, European security and defense and to build strong national armies and, and teach them how to cooperate. And, and I use the metaphor of, of puzzle because it doesn't really work in militaries. You actually need more or less full scale, uh, you know, armies in, in every single country, at least bigger countries. You need missile defenses uh, for basically all of them. For example, something, you know, that is extremely relevant for Ukraine now. And you cannot rely on, on, on other countries, you know, by providing them. You might not need submarines, you know, if you live in the Czech Republic, for example, even if I wouldn't be surprised to find some, you know, in the Czech uh, uh, stocks because of the inefficient, uh, inefficient procurement system that was in place like still 20 years ago. 
So, so I really do believe in sort of full scale militaries uh, that uh, that effectively cooperate. Yeah, and that's my sort of do, do, you. do you also want to address uh, Luigi's uh, perspective? And perhaps I don't know who of you wants to uh, address against um, uh, would oh, be you, Umberto. Okay, great. Yeah. On enlargement. Okay, so um, are you okay with the answer? Do you want to address more directly uh, Luigi's uh, skepticism or? Uh, no, I, I think it was more of a comment. And okay. A kind of agreement. So. Yeah, so okay. I, I would I would agree uh, with that. Th thank you, Vitek. Okay, so thanks. You have two um, questions as well. On Luigi's question, actually, we could spend a few hours in trying to debate and clarify whether the 70s or the 90s, but in just one minute, I will point out three and a half points. First one, the 70s. It is the moment in which the American support toward European integration ended. One of <laughs> or at least this was the commission's perception. The end of the Bretton Woods system, 1971, we have tons of documents produced by the European Commission in which the European Commission described Nixon's decision as an assault on the common market. Second point, uh, it is the 70s in which uh, the European UK, the European community defined itself as a civilian power vis-a-vis -vis the military power of the United States. So there is a clear difference and there is the MDTs in the 70s that a sense of Euro exceptionalism emerged. Again, this is something which is developed in contrast to the United States. Uh, let's think about the way in which Europeans, Western Europeans received and perceived the Marshall Plan and 1969 Jean-Jacques Chrebier, Le Défi Américain there's a huge difference in the way in which Europeans perceive the American economy. Third point, third major point, if we look at European, for, let's call them European foreign relations and American foreign policy in the 70s, there are two huge, incredibly huge different factors. One is toward the Soviet Union, but all of the time ended in 1979, European detente continued until the 90s, actually, until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The other different path is the Middle East. It is in the 70s that Western European defined their own policy toward the Middle East and the Middle Eastern conflict, which was radically different from the American stance. Half point, uh, if we look at the 90s, at the early 90s, and also the late 90s, I see a strong Atlantic bound. At the beginning of the 90s, through the UN Human Rights Conference in Vienna, and there is this strong Western definition of human rights vis-a-vis -vis the so-called Asian values. In the late 90s, with Clinton's intervention in the Yugoslav conflict to rescue Western Europe, which is unable to, to act in this conflict. So to some extent, even the lack of the common enemy was matched by a renewed sense of Atlanticism in the 90s. The answer and the enlargement here I do not have a clear answer, but I have two points in my mind. The first one is the Copenhagen criteria and the fact that we relied, probably we relied too much on the uh, <laughs> normative and transform transformative power of the Copenhagen criteria. The other point has to do with transatlantic relations and the 2003 war. There was a brutal acceleration because of Bush's diplomacy toward the new euro, which was perceived by, uh, I think, the Saudi Commission and many European governments as a challenge, as a, as a mortal threat to the European Union. And so in order to balance, to counterbalance Bush diplomacy, there was this acceleration uh, for the enlargement. It's not an answer to you to your question, but it's something to complicate it a little bit. Thank you, Berto. So I would uh, propose a last round of applause for 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 the speakers. I'm I'm sorry for <laughs> for the last two questions, um, but perhaps you, you can you can talk uh, at the end. So thank you very much for taking for participating and being so effective also in addressing all these questions. I think you should be happy because you actually raise all the interest of the, of the audience. So thank you very much again. And see you later in the afternoon and at free. At free. Thank you very much.